Well, I think we'll I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, it's my uh, profound honor today uh, to introduce my uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Dan Tan. To speak up to. Uh, so I have a proud honor to introduce a good friend, uh, Dr. Dan Jen, who's going to speak to us about the uh, American Board of Surgery's launch of the Trustful Professional Activities, which is really our, our move in the United States to competency-based education uh, in uh, residency programs and general surgery to start off with, and then in other programs, as Dr. Dan will describe uh, in the future. Dr. Dan really doesn't need much uh, introduction in the world of uh, surgical education. He's frankly a master of surgical education has been a leader in numerous organizations. Uh, I think you just flew back from the ACGME meeting uh, just now, so it's involved in ACGME. Been a past president of the Association of Program Directors of Surgery. Uh, he was on the executive committee of the uh, Board of Governors of the American College of Surgeons, where he uh, was the education pillar of lead. Uh, he's on, he serves with me on the Council of the American Board of Surgery, and he's the chair of the General Surgery Board. And I think perhaps the most important uh, credential that Dr. Dent has to be able to give this talk is he was a program director for 15 years. And I think that uh, that credential is probably perhaps the most important credential to have uh, in speaking about uh, residency education. So Dr. Dent, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind and excessive introduction. Um, so yeah, like Josh said, I'm gonna talk about entrustable professional activities and surgery residency. Um, in terms of disclaimers, this is an unusual talk for me because I do have to disclose that much of the content for this talk was provided by the American Board of Surgery. And so I uh, kind of am speaking on behalf of the board, uh, not on behalf of any of the other organizations uh, in which I hold uh, leadership roles. So, uh, here in the U.S., we've got multiple data points that show that we're coming up short in training our surgical graduates these days. Um, one notable paper uh, from 2013 by uh, Samir Matar uh, documented a survey of fellowship directors that multiple fellows were not capable of doing lap coles in minimally invasive surgery fellowships. Uh, and I'll tell you, we saw an example of this back when we had a minimally invasive surgery fellowship in San Antonio uh, and brought in a fellow that had been trained in another institution as well. So a lot of people will quibble about these numbers, but the fact that they're not zero, I think, speaks to there's a problem. Uh, and then a paper that uh, the I co-authored uh, was a survey of the uh, residents, PGY5 residents, uh, after they took the in-training exam on what do they think they can do and self-efficacy being the important column here you know a lot of them feel they can but these numbers should be 100 percent okay let's be clear these numbers should be 100 percent and they're not and even for lack coley and lack happy they're not 100 percent only 84 percent are confident they can do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, and if you look across the entire board only 7.7% felt they could do all 10 of those procedures. And the, the truth is, in that 7.7%, there's probably a contribution from the overconfident who aren't really able to do all of those procedures. So uh, we, we've got a problem. And right now, we train for 60 months, and you have to do 850 major cases and a certain number of cases in certain categories. But the, the British have looked at this, and they've shown, for example, that, projecting? No. Um, that, uh, that in England, you have to do 50 lap coles to sit for your exams. But at 80 lap coles, 50% of trainees are competent. At 180 lap coles, 95% of trainees are competent. 5% still aren't at 180 lap coles. Um, yet you only need 50 to sit for your boards. So that's a, that's a mismatch. And they have, this article has data on colectomy and, and some other procedures as well. 
So what does training to competence mean? Well, we've published some work out of our skill center here in San Antonio, looking at FLS task five, which is intracorporeal suturing. And we got some uh, naive, uh, laparoscopically naive people, meaning senior medical students. And we asked them to meet the FLS standard that shows that you will pass the exam, uh, which is two trials in a row under three minutes with Good, uh, good performance. And we asked them to train to meet that standard and follow them to see how long it would take and how many repetitions it would take. And it took them 12 reps in 90 minutes. So then we created three study groups. And if you look at the orange boxes here, those are the pre-training in the study groups. And the um, one group trained for 90 minutes because we knew that's how long it takes to get competent if you focus on it. One group did 12 reps because we knew that's how many reps it takes if you focus on it to get competent. And one group was told the proficiency metrics they were expected to meet and told train until you meet them, just like the pre-trial group. And if you look at the results here in the green boxes, I, I saw this slide multiple times and a number of groups have done similar work on similar tasks and it took me a while to really appreciate the importance of this slide but the important part is if you look at the green box on the right the group that was told very clearly what the proficiency metrics are the worst trainee in that group is better than the best trainee or as good as the best trainee in the other two groups and I would suggest to you, if you think about the residency program you trained in or the residency program you, you work in, that the green box on the left is kind of where we are right now in producing our graduates. You think about the last chief class you graduated, there's a variety of ability in that group. And, um, and, and that's not where we need to be. We need to be over on the far right where our worst graduates are people that we would trust to operate on ourselves or our family members. And Jason Kempenick, who uh, took over for me as the program director a couple of years ago here in San Antonio, has shown that you can do this. And I think about those residents that do 150 of something and aren't competent. I think that probably suggests a learning environment that doesn't maximize their opportunity to ramp up to competence. And it's a learning environment where they show up unprepared and the faculty member leads them through a case and they walk away not having learned a whole lot or having accomplished a whole lot uh, as a, a trainee. Um, Jason Kempenick took robotic inguinal hernia, broke it down into four phases and has our learners, our residents, prove competence at each phase along the way and it takes them between 12 and 20 procedures to get competent for the entire procedure and they follow the results of the residents doing the whole procedure um, and their results are just as good as the two uh, best minimally invasive robotic surgeons that we have. They take a little longer. They have, it takes 50 to get as fast as our best robotic surgeons, but it takes 12 to 20 to get as good and as safe as our best robotic surgeons if you create the right learning environment and have the learner coming to the table with an expectation of what they're gonna learn that day, and they are prepared, and you give them that opportunity to show what they can do. So, with that as a background, the American Board of Surgery is embarking on entrustable professional activities, which are the core units of competency-based education. CBRE stands for Competency-Based Resident Education. And if you put enough EPAs together, you can define a specialty. I want to be clear though, an EPA is not a procedure. It's not doing an appendectomy, but it is managing patients with right lower quadrant pain. It's the preoperative assessment, it's the postoperative care and the management of complications, in addition to doing a good appendectomy. And I'm convinced that our faculty are gonna like EPAs much better than the ACGME competencies that we currently work on. And an EPA is really an essential task of a discipline um, that, uh, again, can define a specialty. 
And it shifts assessment from some abstract concept to watching the resident do the things that we're passionate about doing every day. It's why we get up and go to work. And I think they're gonna be more relatable. This is Rebecca Minter, who's been one of the leaders of the EPA uh, program at the board. Um, her, her point is the rank and file faculty don't need to know what's going on under the hood, okay? They just need to know, can this person be trusted to manage right or quadrupane? That's all they need to know. They don't need to know the names of the competencies. They don't need to know the milestones. They just need to know, can I trust this person to do the thing that we do on my service every day? And as an example, the faculty are gonna be asked, do you trust resident X to manage a patient with inguinal hernia? Not how good is that resident at problem-based learning and improvement, which is a vague concept that people struggle with, okay? Is, there, is that resident good at managing patients with biliary stone disease? Not how good is resident at systems-based practice? Um, and can they manage a patient with right lower quadrant pain versus how good is their interpersonal and communication skills? So here are the 18 EPAs. Uh, we got them by body part with a picture of Vanessa Lindemann who's played, played a huge role uh, in doing this. She's one of our council members on the board who has helped lead the writing group that's writing the EPAs. Um, and you see the four off to the left, surgical consultation, trauma, management of a critically ill patient, and flexible endoscopy. And then there are 14 that are anatomically based. Uh, so this makes up the 18 EPAs. And here are the authors of the 18 EPAs, which I expect to roll out and be published any day now. Um, we on the General Surgery Board reviewed all 18 EPAs. We assigned five board members to review each EPA, and we went through a review process. It's been a very busy spring, uh, reviewing each of those and uh, giving feedback to the writing group. The writing group has a professional medical writer that is looking across all the EPAs for consistency across them. Um, and it's been a, a huge, giant team effort. And here's the part that, again, you don't need to know, okay? EPA functions, managing patients with right lower quadrant pain, map to milestones and map to competencies, but the average faculty member doesn't need to know this. With that said, the board has done the mapping um, for the programs, and they map to all of the milestones that is currently the surgery, surgeries ACGME milestones. They map to all of them except professionalism three, which is an administrative milestone that says you keep up with your duty hours reports and you um, keep up with your medical records uh, and a couple other things. So we're still trying to figure out if we want to maybe semi-artificially map one of the EPAs to that. Uh, but uh, they do map to all the other milestones uh, that we currently have. But again, the average rank and file faculty member doesn't have to know this. But here's an example of the gallbladder EPA that the preoperative phase maps to three milestones, the intraoperative phase maps to four, and the post-operative phase maps to, map to three more. Um, and this is an example of the kind of progression through the EPA that you will see from a learner as they progress from the not yet competent to fully competent, okay? They know some basic anatomy, can take a generic h &P and communicate basic information, is a level one performance, all the way down to level four is a great clinician, okay? And that's what we expect from our people when they graduate, not level five, level four is what we expect from people when they graduate because it's a great clinician. Level five is someone who can be an institutional leader in managing like clinical pathways in your institution in the care of these patients. So the average trainee, we are looking for a level four before they graduate. Intraoperatively, similarly, um, level one is can describe basic anatomy uh, and maybe you know close the skin and do a couple of things. 
The level four is a very competent technical surgeon. Level five is somebody that can help improve care of the surgical patients at large uh, in your operating rooms. And then post-operatively, similarly, you know, the happy who gets well and goes home, the, the person that can manage that person that does well is a level one, uh, as opposed to the person who can manage individual patients with all the complications is a level four, and then the person who creates institutional policies is a level five. Okay, in between, I'm skipping over the intermediate phases that would be like the average PGY2 who can recognize some complications, but maybe not all of them, that sort of thing. Uh, and so here's just another way of, of saying that on the left column here, you know, the, the person that can do limited participation requires direct supervision, indirect supervision, practice ready, and can teach others. There are other themes intertwined in the EPA, such as patient safety, cost effectiveness, and coordination of care in some of our subspecialties that are really team sports, uh, particularly uh, some of the surgical oncology, uh, trauma, uh, and teams that work with critical care groups. There's developing personal learning plans. We built uh, doing self-care uh, into the critically management of the critically ill patient. Uh, timeliness in some of these patients, evidence-based practice is also built into some of the EPAs. And this is based on a two-year pilot that the board conducted looking at five EPAs um, to pilot them at 28 institutions. Our institution was one of them. And across those institutions, there were over 6,000 resident observations. Um, and 85% of those observations came from surgical faculty. An important point is that 14% did not come from surgical faculty. They were in the provides consultation EPA provided by emergency medicine faculty or hospital medicine faculty or other groups that would observe our residents providing consultation, talking to families, talking to the provider that sent the referral and giving feedback to them. And not surprisingly, there was a wide variety of uh, success in, uh, in gathering evaluations and getting feedback to the residents. Uh, this is the number of observations by institution. There, some institutions had hundreds and thousands and over a thousand. Some institutions had very few. And this, frankly, is what we expect to see as a similar graph across the 350 uh, surgical residency programs. And what we figured out is this is going to be a continuous quality improvement project. Okay, uh, I actually had one of my residents present on that topic at the Southwestern Surgical two weeks ago, where we've been doing EPAs across eight surgical residency programs in our institution. And it's, it's a process you just start it, and however many evaluations you get in the first year, you try to be better the next year. And you work with your residents, you work with your faculty, you do some development, and you keep working on it. And I think that's what we're about to embark on. So we're trying to send, we're, I, I'll confess, we're sending mixed messages. We want the first year launch to be perfect, but we recognize it won't be, and it will be a continuous quality improvement project. There's a lot of information available uh, at the board's website, and I'll show that link in a minute. Um, the board did uh, select SIMPLE, the Society for Improving Medical Professional Learning, to provide the technical support. Any of you are program directors, you've seen the email list over the last few days. People are having challenges getting contracts signed um, based on their lawyers at their institutions, but uh, SIMPLE has ways they have, the, the data is protected. The board will not see any data on any trainee during training. The board will only see the data that a trainee loads when it's time for them to say, I am ready to sit for the qualifying exam. And so they'll have to load their data prior to taking the exam. But whether it took you 100 gallbladders or 20 gallbladders or 300 gallbladders to get competent is not going to be 
uh, important to the board. How you're performing as a PGY two or three is not going to be important to the board. What's important to the board is that you are deemed competent at the time you graduate and are eligible to sit for the exams. So the simple micro assessments uh, are pre-populated and they've just changed the verbiage on this. It was easiest one third, middle one third, hardest one third. Uh, some data sets have shown that there are almost no easiest one third cases. Um, nobody, nobody confesses that a case they did was easy. Um, so they've changed the verbiage to straightforward, moderate, and complex. Then you add in a level of entrustment, and then you dictate narrative feedback. For the residents, the narrative feedback is the most valuable piece of this. How can they do better next time? Okay. What's an area that they struggled with, and what suggestions do you have for how to do better? Um, and the goal in this is if you get enough of these one minute, literally one minute micro assessments, you may not have to do end of rotation evaluations. We're, we're looking at maybe setting that up on our services where if our faculty on a given service can do 20 or 30, we still haven't decided the threshold, um, micro assessments during a rotation, it will auto populate the end of rotation evaluation because we have enough data to know how that resident did. We don't need you to do it again. Uh, it, for a while, we're going to confirm that before we make it a process, but um, so there'll be a little extra work probably for a while, but eventually we want to take away work. Uh, as mentioned, the data will be held securely by Simple, uh, and uh, the goal is that this will lead to regular dialogue between the faculty and the residents as they progress toward competence. Uh, but anybody that is going to sit for the written exam, the qualifying exam in July of 2028 will need to provide their EPA evaluations as part of their application. There are a variety of papers published uh, relative to the process that the board has gone through over the last seven years to get to this point. Um, and the board has an EPA link that can uh, get to all the questions you might have uh, with regard to how this is going to work out. Uh, there's a frequently frequently asked questions section as well, FAQs. So with that, uh, I've left, it looks like, oh, 20 minutes for discussion. So I'm um, happy to stop there and answer any questions that people might have. So thank you for your attention. In one of your earlier slides, you showed Zurich the residents to feel comfortable being able to do these procedures. And over the years, we are older, trained, and we got through it, and we, we figured it out somehow. So do you think the reason that the residents aren't as comfortable doing these procedures is their fault, or is it our fault? Are we just looking at them more carefully? Um, and, and then that's number one. And number two is, what if we find in 2028 that the numbers are abysmal and you don't allow 40% of general surgery graduates to sit for their board? What's the workforce implication on that? I mean, we're, we're struggling to train enough surgeons now. Not that we want to take murderers and, and board certify them, but what, what's the implication if our well intentions don't pan out. So two great questions. First question, it's everybody's fault. Okay, and but it's a complex thing. You can find publications from 50 years ago about how the current graduates are not prepared for practice. Okay, so I don't think this is a new problem. I think it's come a little more into focus because a couple of reasons we're under greater scrutiny. And I think, like, I, I've been in practice, I finished residency in 1996. I think surgery has become increasingly complex, such that we're actually asking more of our trainees than was ever asked uh, of me, frankly. You know, I had to learn to do a hernia one way, okay? The fact that I learned how to do one laparoscopically was kind of a bonus uh, as of 1996. Uh, you know, the oncologic things, were really straightforward and simple and you, you you didn't have to 
do as complicated a procedure or know as much about radiation oncology and chemotherapy and neoadjuvant therapy and things like that. So I think I, I think it's a long-standing problem. But I also think that um, our uh, concern for malpractice and some of our supervision policies have undermined our trainees and their ability to grow competence and confidence. With regard to your second question, um, you know, we, we recognize, we're not advertising it, but we recognize that a lot of the people, if, if the evaluators are honest, there are going to be a lot of surgical residents that across those 18 EPAs are not at level four on all 18, okay? But if you're going to go do a minimally invasive fellowship, maybe you don't need to be level four on thyroid or trauma or something that's not going to be part of your practice. But the fellowships are also developing EPAs. And what the thought process is, is we're going to have a more transparent transition. So even if you hire someone into your practice straight out of training, you can see their EPA evals, and you can say, I can leave them alone on biliary and appendectomy stuff, but if they're going to do thyroids as part of their practice, I'm going to have to mentor them because they didn't achieve independence in thyroids. And so I think we're going to get to an era of, of increased transparency. Um, we may ultimately, let's just say, a year or two before that class comes up, we will have access to the aggregate data to see how they're progressing. And there will be some tough decisions that the board will have to make in terms of if people have not all progressed to level four. I feel fortunate I won't be on the board anymore at that time, so I won't have to be part of that discussion. But um, that will be an interesting conversation. Yeah, and just not there. So if they don't progress, I mean, do we get a pass from the ACPME as, as a program director to fire somebody? Because, you know, it's kind of a black mark. You take a categorical and then you look three years, you wash them out. Hey, you know, you just, you're not cutting it. How long do you give people to go? And will the board and the ACGME mesh and then say, well, yeah, this person is just not meant to be a surgeon. It's okay, you can cut them loose and we're not going to be in your program for doing that. Yeah, so um, I'm going to put on my ACGME board of directors hat and answer that question. If if efforts are made to help a trainee address areas where they're coming up short, and despite the program's best efforts, that trainee does not meet your standards, the ACGME is okay with you helping that person find another position, another option in either medicine or whatever that would be a better fit for their career. The ACGME does not want to produce position. Now that being said, okay, I. My APDS presidential address was the messaging I got from both the ACGME and the American Board of Surgery about us holding high standards. We held residents back a couple of times, and we got letters from both organizations saying, if you do this anymore, you will be viewed as an unstable program and it will trigger an immediate site visit, not congratulations on doing competency-based training and holding high standards, which is, I think, the letters we should have gotten. Uh, but those views have changed, as near as I can tell, at both the board and at the ACG. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dent. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, so you already have the Cambridge mask. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, does this mean that someone is, you know, meets this criteria and you have three, they're ready to graduate. So now I have to find another resident to fill a spot because it's no longer a five-year program. Uh, Not yet. Not yet, and, but we're going to transition to that. Maybe again, I'll be retired by then, fortunately. But um, I can see that being the case in ten to twenty years. The current thing that's being trialed, um, actually in Boston, uh, although the surgery program dropped out of the trial, they were part of it initially uh, at Mass General, uh, is what they call promotion in place. And so the idea being, if you're committed to sixty months of training but you prove competent at right lower quadrant pain and you're on a night of acute care surgery call and in that night you get a gallbladder, a ruptured spleen, and an appendectomy. On the gallbladder and the ruptured spleen, you're still a trainee and your faculty member has to be present to send a bill and that sort of thing. But it, um, CMS actually approved that the resident could bill for the appendectomy in that setting. 
okay? And so as an acute care surgeon, I can sleep through the appendectomy and get up for the gallbladder or the ruptured spleen. And then once the person's confident in gallbladder surgery, I can sleep through the gallbladder, you know, a month later on their next night, you know, when they're on call. Uh, and so promotion in place, I think, would be the transition to the you can finish when you've proven confidence uh, thing. But I think we may go from where we are to promotion in place to you're done when you're confident. So I kind of bring this to post training, you know, you know, the old guys. How is that going to affect us as we get older? You know, are they going to tell us, you know what, you're, uh, you know, you trained in uh, laparoscopic surgery, now you're not good at robotic surgery, you should not be doing it. Uh, or uh, new rules. That will always be, credentialing will always be a local hospital decision. Uh, the board, uh, I've never heard any discussion about anything like that. Um, besides, we're all awesome. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I've, I've never heard anything about that. It, it, that's, that's not gonna be any different than when laparoscopy first came in in the 90s. It's gonna be a local credentialing decision. Yeah, my name is Ryan, great to see you as always topic that we've been working on obviously you know a couple of years with the EPA. My question to you is do you think we got it right in terms of the five-year arbitrary 60-month training that we, we espoused? If you look at our colleagues across the pond in the UK, uh, the King, that they have a, a system where you know until they don't think you're ready, you're not ready. And right. so we set this arbitrary timeline for people and we then the program directors are incentivized to move Sally and John along because otherwise, you, just like you said, the ACGME will look at you and say, it's your program, dummy. But is it? And, and is it a way that to say, like, look, if it takes somebody just a little bit longer, that, that's okay. The reason I ask you that is because we've got this push for these integrated programs. How much of a basic general surgery knowledge do you need? So it's a two-fold question. I see integrated programs. Is 60 months really the right amount of time to do I think if we do it right, it is. I think if you go back to the, you know, Halstead had a competency-based residency, right? But they average graduating one chief every two to three years while bringing in 10 per year. Okay, well, that's not going to meet our workforce demands. Right? I think in his 20-some-odd years, they graduated like 12 chiefs or something. Um, and so, I, I, but I think what we're going to see is if we do it right, five years is about the right amount of time for the majority of trainees. I, I've always thought like somewhere around 10% could probably be done in four and somewhere around 10% probably needs six. But if you have a good residency program where you ask a lot of them and expect a lot of them and they show up prepared and you give them opportunities to show what they can do, I think we're in the ballpark of time. It's probably the best answer I can give. Hi, Tracy Campo. I noticed that the professionals and interpersonal skills kind of seemed like something you were trying to get ticked off in those categories. Are you at all concerned that it's not going to be properly addressed? Because as we see, the newer and newer generations, because of cell phones and TikTok, their interpersonal skills kind of declining, and you get a lot of patient so are you at all concerned about that? I am. Uh, I, I do think that's one of the potential pitfalls here. And uh, I'll tell you, I've had to kind of come full circle on this. When the board first uh, put out a letter that said it had intent to go to competency-based education, I was not on the board. I was actually the president of the APDS and had to push back against it on behalf of program directors. So I had to write the letter against competency-based education back in April of 2016. Uh, but it wasn't that I was against it in general. What I was against is at that time, their thought was, we're gonna wipe everything away and start competency-based next year. And I wanted to start dropping elements of competence into our current training model because of concerns about things like professionalism. I, I worry that, you know, if you think about a, uh, Boy Scout or Girl Scout that collects merit badges, uh, I, I think that we could 
create a group that goes around kind of pushing and shoving their peers aside to get their merit badges to get out first and doesn't really meet the they might meet some of the letters of the law but they don't meet the intent of some of these things just like on our oral board exam you know we tell someone on post-op day four after a colectomy a patient gets sick they always, the answer is always well i stop what i'm doing and go to that patient's bedside well of course you say that in the hotel room but whether they actually do that in practice is, is a whole other question and i think we need that demonstrated over the course of the five years and that's a piece of it. The other thing that is, is clear to me uh, from these EPAs is with 18 EPAs, I think we've captured somewhere around 75 to 80% of general surgical practice. I don't think we've captured anywhere near 100% of it. And it's gonna be harder for us as general surgeons than any other specialty because if you go back 100 plus years, it was just surgery. Right, everything. Brain surgery, spine surgery, bone surgery, tongue surgery, hysterectomies. And what's happened is all the subspecialties have taken out very defined parts so they can define their specialties. Urology can define its specialty very easily. Gynecology can define its specialty very easily. Ophthalmology. General surgery is that amorphous mass that's left. And so for us to fully define general surgery through EPAs is going to be a real challenge. And so I think of this as this is EPAs 1.0. After we graduate a class with this, we'll learn more and we'll go to EPAs 2.0 and it'll be better, but it still probably won't be the, the complete product and it might take four or five iterations to get there. One thing I should have mentioned in my talk is we're going to um, learn more from the vascular surgeons. Those of you who are vascular surgeons, they're going to EPAs for their entering fellows on July 1, 2024, so a year after us, but it's a two-year fellowship. So in 2026, they'll be graduating people two years before we are. So we'll see how their process works out and be able to learn from it because our first graduates won't be coming out until 2028 from the EPA process. So we'll hopefully learn a lot from them. But I, I do think some of what people probably erratically call the soft skills has potential to get lost in, in collecting merit badges for doing appendectomies and colon Yes. Thank you, Dan. It's definitely so far stuff that we had. So my question as a PD is for the faculty and increasing the administrative completion of evaluations and stuff. Currently we have six OPRS forms and six cameo forms and this uh, Those go away. They will go away yep. immediately for 2024 graduates. No, for 2028 graduates. Okay, so for the for the ones if, who are going to graduate. If, if you get that many, I am 95 percent sure about what I'm about to say. Let me put that out there. Okay. <laughs> if if you get that many simple evals on your graduates that will graduate in 24. I am 95% sure the board will accept that as acceptable. So yeah, if you'll move everything to simple instead of the OPRS and the other things, um, you'll need some clinic evals and some operative evals, but yes. So based on the experience as a pilot side, what's the acceptable number of these micro assessments uh, at acceptable compared to a formal end of rotation? Yeah, so that's a great question. The, the short answer is we don't know the answer yet. The Canadians are actually doing this. So the, in Canada, you know, the Royal College of Surgeons and their board and their equivalent of the Residency Review Committee are all kind of one. They, they work more collaboratively than they do here in the United States. And they started CompTIA-based training in general surgery a couple years ago. They're finding that you need at least 20 evals on most of their EPAs. But I've not yet heard how, what the breakdown of how many are pre-op, how many are post-op, and how many are intra-op. Uh, but the, the goal would be 20 to 30 evals per EPA, so the resident would need 360 to 540 uh, evals uh, per resident to graduate. But they can start getting them. You know, ultimately, if you've got a few that are at level four, you know, I, I'll be really honest, maybe more honest than I should be. It, 
you know, some of the residents are not going to get the evals until they're ready to have someone say they're ready for practice, right? So they're going to have three evals that says, you know, I'm ready for practice, and we're going to have a hard time figuring out if that's sufficient or not. But that combined with the clinical competency committee's decision making based on other pieces of input is what the board can accept uh, on their board application. Presentation not that uh, Annie Safai from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, and we have the opportunity of being both a new graduate uh, of the vascular surgery program of the fellow and you're attending. My question is um, the, the survey from the ACGME about the residents saying how confident they feel for certain uh, interventions. Um, do you foresee any challenges between an academic setup and a community hospital or a private setup? for implementing the EPA, considering that um, a lot of resident autonomy uh, sometimes is hampered because things need to move fast. Um, so do you, you know, see any challenges from that respect? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that pressure is building at the, the academic centers as well, the county hospitals and every DAs or are also trying to, try to improve uh, their efficiency. Uh, and I would refer you to Jason Kepenick's article on that. That was one of the reasons he did that, was because he can let the resident come in and say, you're going to do the peritoneal flap. And when you can do the peritoneal flap well, and in X minutes, then I can let you move on to the second part of the operation as well. Or we can, I'll do the peritoneal flap, you know, twice as fast as you, but then you can focus on the next part. But if you get with a learner, if you're doing elective surgery, you get with a learner the night before the case, and you ask them, what do you need to work on? And what can I let you work on? And you target a very specific skill. You create expectations on their part and your part, and everybody's happy, as long as it's something that helps them progress uh, in their education. Yeah. You know, I think you need to work on camera driving when you're a PG-5, probably isn't the answer. And I've seen some faculty that have, that have said that, but but you know, if you let them have a skill and do a piece of the operation that's meaningful to them and helps them progress toward confidence, they'll be happy. And you don't have to let them do the entire procedure to have them have a good, meaningful experience. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you all very much. Thank you. 
So we will go ahead and get started this day on time. So our next session is updates and surgical oncology. Um, I'm Kelly Murphy, I'm a surgical oncologist from the University of Colorado Monterey Slack Review today. And we are going to start our session um, talking about the management of colorectal cancer. And we have Dr. Colin Atport uh, presenting for us today um, from our local health care system in Houston called Cincinnati today. Thank you for inviting me to talk today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm uh, one of the surgical oncologists here at the uh, Mace Cancer Center in uh, San Antonio. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the management of uh, colorectal uh, liver metastasis. Uh, and I have no disclosures for this talk. Um, I wanted to start the talk uh, by mentioning kind of the uh, theoretical underpinnings here um, uh, on why this is a surgical disease. Um, this is an uh, autopsy study of 1,500 patients uh, with metastatic colorectal cancer. The majority, 75%, were found out of uh, liver metastases at the time of death. And of those, uh, a large proportion, about half, uh, 35%, uh, had uh, metastases only to the liver uh, at the time of death. And that kind of supports this theory that if we can gain control of the disease in the liver, uh, we can provide a, a durable disease response or even cure this disease. It also kind of raises the question of how we should think of liver metastases in colorectal cancer. Are they truly metastatic disease? Um, or is there more of a regional phenotype or an oligometastatic phenotype, like how we think of uh, uh, node disease uh, and cancer from other sites? Um, there was no question if we look back uh, to the 80s and 90s uh, that that was not the case. This is a widely metastatic phenotype. You know, uh, in this study, mainly from the 90s of 3,800 patients, uh, the presence of liver metastases was associated with uh, worse outcomes, similar to per uh, peritoneal disease. Um, and that led to a lot of guidelines that uh, basically restricted uh, the role of surgery in this disease. Um, this paper is saying that it's of dubious value, uh, or this one from uh, Glenn Steele, discussing, uh, you know, kind of cherry picking only the very best scenarios in which to offer surgery to this patient. Um, let's compare that to now. Uh, this is a series from where I did my fellowship at uh, MSK. Uh, early to mid-2000s, um, where we see uh, up to 40% of patients with uh, liver-only metastases being cured. And then I, I use the word cured here, which is uh, you know controversial, um, because of data from MSK, uh, where there are basically no deaths from disease uh, if patients survive 10 years after resection. Um, so that's why I can say cured. Uh, so what's changed in that 30 years uh, from the 80s through the uh, our time now. Um, part of this, the way we think of this, uh, you know, the more traditional mindset is uh, by what comes out. Uh, you know, only resect if there's less than four lesions or unilateral disease. Uh, anything over five centimeters, don't consider resection, and definitely don't do anything if there's any extra hepatic disease. Uh, versus now, uh, where we think more about um, if a resection is feasible. Uh, can we achieve an R0 resection? Are there two contiguous liver segments? And what's the FLR look like? In terms of what happened uh, over that 30-year uh, span, you know, local regional therapies and surgical techniques certainly improved a little. Uh, but I would argue the most important thing that happened was uh, chemotherapy. Uh, you know, it was a brief kind of overview of uh, 
what's going on in those years. If we look at best supportive care at the top here, uh, you know, generally six to eight months, introduction of single agent, uh, five or fewer gibcetabine, about a year. Uh, once you get up to doublet therapy, year and a half, approaching two years, and then uh, the most modern trial is full box uh, BEV, uh, looking at about two and a half years uh, now. And that, that really is uh, the most important improvement that's been made since the 90s. Um, what we have found, though, is that with better systemic therapy, there are certainly more indications for resection, more of a role for surgery in this disease. Uh, this is a, uh, a combined series from MD Anderson and Mayo Clinic of 2,500 patients, uh, looking at the percentage of patients who had a liver resection at some point during their disease course. Uh, in the early 90s, low single digits. Uh, introduction of 5-FU, um, uh, you know, around 5% of patients. But once we see the introduction of Irvine Tiki and Oxaliplatin, it gets up to where it is now, you know, closer to 20 and, and even approaching 30% in some centers. Um, and that's really uh, a testament to if we can get systemic control of this disease and really make it a liver only uh, phenotype, that there is a role for local regional therapies there. Um, what I will say is that there's no level one uh, data to support this, there's no randomized controlled trials, resection versus not. Um, and that's really because there is no equipoise to uh, perform it. So instead, uh, we're really left with case series uh, and observational studies. Um, this is the kaplan meier curve from that study from Andy Anderson and uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, showing that in patients who had a liver resection, uh, five-year overall survival, 55%, those who did not receive a liver resection, uh, 20%. Uh, at the bottom there is the Nordic uh, 7 uh, trial, which is only a modern one where uh, resection was not offered, um, and there it's 9%. Um, as you can see on the uh, on the left over there, um, uh, you know, case series from around the world, multiple large institutions uh, showing similar outcomes. And, and that just really highlights that for this disease, you know, a, a well-performed observational study is what we're gonna have, and uh, at this point, there would be no way to do a randomized controlled trial to prove this, uh, because there's no equipoise to perform that trial. So if you're with me that uh, we should be offering these patients surgery, the next question is who should we be offering it to? Um, there are innumerable uh, risk calculators out there. You know, the Fong Clinical Risk Store has been on the ground for a long time, more modern genomic uh, stratification variables there. It, there's more of these than I could possibly present uh, today. Uh, and all of them look basically the same as, as these two kaplan meier curves here, where you see some stratification, but nothing definitive. And unfortunately, that's kind of where we're at. Um, these risk scores are uh, prognostic, they're not predictive. Uh, they can't really be used at this time to deny patient surgery or say who's gonna have uh, a curative uh, resection. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, you know, there's a huge selection bias that goes into who's being uh, offered surgery and there, there's very low numbers of truly high risk patients that are undergoing surgery. There's a lot of regional and uh, institutional uh, uh, variability that goes into this as well. Finally, this last point at the bottom here is really the, the true answer, which is that we don't really understand the tumor biology of this disease. We don't understand the immunology uh, aspects of it, and so we, we can't really make any sort of uh, yes or no answers of, of how our uh, patients are gonna feel after surgery. Um, I, I think the, certainly the way at, at MSK, uh, people approach this in the way uh, I do as well, uh, is that the better answer is who can be cured, um, uh, or who can be offered a curative resection. Um, what they found in their very large, you know, 2,500 patient uh, experience over the last 20 years, um, if patients have extra hepatic disease, cure rates are below 10%, similarly for positive margins or CA greater than 200 at the time of resection. Uh, if patients have more than 10 tumors, uh, it's less than 5%. And in that database, there were no uh, cures, uh, meaning 10-year survival, uh, in patients who had extra hepatic disease and poor uh, uh, you know, liver biology. Um, CRS score is greater than three. Uh, however, there is now at least one patient um, uh, in that final group. So uh, again, just kind of complicating this whole picture of who, who should we really be offering these surgeries to. Um, I said that chemotherapy was really the thing that's changed the most in the last uh, 30 years in terms of uh, pushing this field forward. Um, I'm just gonna go through that data quickly. Um, you know, neoadjuvant therapy, uh, obviously a big thing in many fields. Uh, the underpinning there is basically that we can select patients with good biology, um, identify active or inactive chemotherapy. Uh, it, this is a great theory. Unfortunately, it's kind of unproven in this disease. Uh, these are two uh, trials that were done. Uh, one on the right here is from uh, 
the US, the other one is from Berlin, kind of showing the same thing, that uh, response to therapy uh, radiographically has uh, no, uh, it doesn't result in any difference in outcomes uh, after surgery. The most important thing is if the patients can get surgery or not. That's really the stratification of the outcomes. Uh, perioperative therapy, kind of similar results. Uh, this is the EORTC trial. Uh, showing uh, perioperative full FOX versus surgery alone. No difference in overall survival in my Kaplan-Meier curve. What was different though, is that the rate of uh, perioperative complications was significantly higher um, with the chemotherapy. And in fact, one patient uh, in the periop uh, therapy group was not able to undergo a curative resection uh, due to uh, liver damage from the uh, chemotherapy. That same group uh, published this data, again showing that the number of cycles of chemotherapy has a huge impact on uh, the rate of uh, complications uh, perioperatively, um, if, you know, less than five cycles, the rate of uh, class three or greater or greater um, complications is less than 20%. By the time you get above 10 cycles, it really goes up quite high. Uh, adjuvant therapy, kind of the same thing here. Uh, no difference in overall survival in uh, four trials at this point in time. Uh, some trend towards significance in the progression-free survival, uh, but we don't really understand why here. Um, uh, you know, I think the real answer is that some of these patients are cured by surgery alone, some likely have indolent disease where we're just not seeing it in the time course of the study, and some are gonna recur because they have an aggressive disease that's not gonna respond to this chemotherapy anyway, and that probably leaves very few patients who are benefiting from this chemo. Uh, as all of you in the US here know, uh, it's mostly irrelevant, uh, as the vast majority of these patients, 90 plus percent, are gonna get chemotherapy before they uh, go to surgery or where they're, before they're referred to a surgeon. So um, I'm going to take two seconds here to talk about uh, uh, hepatic artery infusion pumps. Uh, you know, I, I think this is something that uh, has uh, kind of seen a resurgence uh, recently. Um, I, I'm obviously forced to do this because I'm a Memorial Sloan Gettering grad, and you can't graduate from that institution without talking about pumps. Uh, you know, as a brief uh, kind of background on this, um, liver tumors are uh, infused by the hepatic artery. The parenchyma receives a dual blood supply. Uh, FUDR or fluxuridine um, has a very short half-life and has 99% hepatic clearance. That allows you to treat uh, the liver with 100 to 400 times the dose of uh, 5-FU that you'd be able to do with um, systemic 5-FU. Uh, uh, so generally, quality of life on therapy is much better. Um, a couple different indications here that I'll run through quickly. Uh, uh, as an adjuvant setting uh, after a section, as a new adjuvant, uh, therapy to convert patients to resection uh, and in patients who are refractory to all chemotherapy uh, with liver only disease. And when I talk about HAI therapy, I'm really talking about HAI plus systemic. It's a lower dose of systemic therapy, but these patients are still on systemic therapy at the time that they're on pump therapy as well. Um, this is uh, in the Ashman setting, the uh, Chemi uh, Nomad Journal trial from 1999. Uh, it was a positive trial uh, based on the primary endpoint of two year uh, overall survival. Obviously, if the primary endpoint that had been chosen was three years, it clearly would have been negative there, and you know, there's a lot of criticism of this trial because these curves aren't that different. But I think the most important thing here is actually this, which is the long-term outcomes from this, uh, showing a higher rate of cure, um, a higher rate of long-term durable uh, uh, progression-free survival and uh, uh, overall survival here. And I think this is really a patient-centric me metric, and you talk to patients and say, hey, look, with this pump, there's uh, a higher rate that at 10 years you're still going to be alive, but it, it's much easier to understand than uh, a typical Kaplan-Meier curve. Um, Long-term follow-up from uh, uh, this series here. Um, again, this is uh, from uh, MSK, single institution study. 10-year um, overall survival, 38% uh, with pump versus 24% uh, without pump. Um, uh, no, you know, again, there's a lot of selection bias that goes into this. Uh, however, um, uh, the HAI group generally had more advanced uh, disease uh, than the, uh, the group that did not get the pump. More liver tumors, uh, higher CRS scores, and more Tuesday day sections. And similarly, a uh, new adjuvant group, um, patients who were able to be converted to resection had a survival of 60% versus those who were not able to convert to resection, 15% uh, five-year uh, survival. Uh, again, similar to the Nordic uh, 7 trial uh, with that resection there. Um, so uh, really the question here is, can we convert patients to resection? Be as aggressive as possible with any sort of therapy we have, because if we can get them to resection, we can get this sort of survival for our patients. 
Um, finally, in the refractory setting, uh, this is the LONSERF trial, uh, New England uh, Journal article with a response rate of 1.6%. Uh, you know, these are all patients who've been treated with fulfoxirin of acid beforehand uh, and progressed. So, uh, in comparison to the pump uh, group, uh, not a New England Journal uh, uh, trial, but uh, <laughs> the response rate here was 35%. So, again, much higher uh, with pump chemotherapy when we're talking about liver disease. Um, just as a very quick, uh, what can the pump do? Obviously, this is a uh, you know, patient that we select to show the images, but this is someone who's uh, already gone four cycles of full fox, gets placed on a pump for the burden of disease, uh, and has a great response uh, over the course of six months, gets the reception um, at that point. So in terms of numbers here, uh, looking at the advantages of pump chemotherapy, uh, you know, first line setting response rates as high as 100% in some trials. Uh, even in patients who are refractory, uh, you know, about a third of patients are seeing a, a recess response versus 1.6% with most effective systemic therapy. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, rates of complications with pumps, much lower now with the intravenous reduction of, uh, you know, kind of a dexamethasone and other things in the pump to decrease the rate of delirium sclerosis, which is the real uh, main complication. Um, long term for this pump. And in modern series, pump failure rates are only about 10% at one year. Uh, and so finally, this is you know kind of the uh, way we're approaching uh, uh, colorectal liver mats at the Mass Cancer Center. Uh, I think it's probably similar to many of your institutions. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think the real question now is what is the role uh, of the pump in these various categories and, and then where can we use other new therapies such as, you know, uh, transplant for colorectal liver mats uh, or, or newer systemic therapies as they come up. With that, uh, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, talk, to talk about colorectal mass in 15 minutes. Cash can become soup or something. Uh, my question is, uh, Mr. Postunia, you are privileged to be in an academic center where you have oncologists, everyone with the same goal, and those of us who get patients from a community setting, we oncologists have already given eight to ten cycles of chemo to the fatty liver, and some of these uh, resectable tumors were vanished. And what do you do with those vanishing mats that no other evidence that we see very often? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is definitely a really tough one. I mean, we, we've uh, seen a couple where we've even placed the new shells if they're starting to fall away and the oncologist still wants to treat with a couple more cycles because it's really nice to know where those are going to be. Certainly, there's data from a lot of centers that even if the med is completely disappeared, 90% of the time there will still be active tumor uh, at the site if you do a resection. I, I think the other thing is we don't really know, you know, in terms of the timing of surgery there it is do we need to resect right after treatment when it's still there if we have a recurrence can you resect at that point in time I, I don't think we understand that tumor biology so I, I think it's more just if it's disappeared great surveillance it's probably going to come back though and then resect at that point in time hopefully you get the referral before they treat with another 10 cycles very nice talk tonight we have to skip and keep off I have a question about multiple times mentioned the cure I'm not sure exactly correct you know, terminology. There's a lot of these patients are alive, but they're not disease free. Is that, you know, it's, 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 despite the fact that overall survival has improved, but we still have a five, we have five years of rate of disease free survival. It's still 10, 15%. I don't know. So, so I, I, I had um, that slide up there at one point in time where um, basically uh, a study from MSK looked at 500 patients. Uh, there, were, there was one death out of those 500 patients of uh, people who had survived for 10 years um, who died of disease. So when I say cure here, I'm, it really means that you're not going to die of your disease if you survive 10 years after surgical resection. So I agree. It, cure is a loaded word. There's no question there. But I would also argue that when you're talking with patients about this, you know, trying to, you know, talk about well, what's you know overall survival versus disease-free survival, or you might have the disease. You know, I, I think that the term cure is something that people understand, and so I can quote percentages of what's the chance you're going to die of this disease, um, and so I'm using cure as a, a stand-in for that. 
so great presentation of uh, both that. So thank you very much uh, for a really thorough uh, summary. Uh, certainly the trumpet's yet another tool of armamentarium now for uh, liver only disease for colon metastases. What about transplant? Uh, you know, it's certainly for HCC that's very common. Um, but what, what situation would you consider it? Um, is it ever going to be appropriate? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the real answer is yes. Um, uh, I, I kind of have it up here in the you know question marker, and I, I think that's the problem is that you know how many patients are there where you're going to uh, you know be willing to hold off on other potentially uh, you know effective therapies, be they you know resection or pump or other stuff like that, because there's a lot of programs that have uh, or transplant centers that are saying, well, we won't do transplant after pump. And so we kind of have two, not necessarily fully competing therapies, but they're, they're both there. Um, I think that's the big question is, is how do we kind of bridge that gap between those two? Because, uh, you know, pump's good for about two or three years, and then it starts, you start running into problems, failure, sclerosis, other stuff like that. But if someone's gone two to three years and they don't have any extra hepatic disease, I mean, that's certainly a place where transplant can, you know, you can kind of consolidate your response that you've gotten from pump and resection and other stuff like that. So I, I think there's a role, I just think we need more studies at this point in time. I think what in 64, they just published, there's been 64 transplants for colorectal liver cuts uh, as of right now. So it's still early days for that. Yeah, we have to be careful to talk about transplant because this is the case. We have to just be super selective. The real patient for transplant, 90% of them have the drugs. Because of two chemo or very pump, you can keep those patients alive. But I think before we open this question, offer everybody to transplant, I think we have to be careful because we, the main problem with transplant, we don't have enough patients to transplant very serious. But I think for very selective group of patients, maybe somebody with a stable for prolonged period of time, or disease only in their liver, and also we know their biology. We should have favorable biology. <laughs> Yeah, you, the other thing I'd say is if you look at the data from the second two trial, the, not the one, you know, the second one trial that kind of started this whole movement again, but the data is not, the post-transplant is not that dissimilar to, uh, you know, major academic centers doing liver resection and pump and other stuff like this for initially unresectable, you know, kind of, uh, I think it was like 72% at uh, three years. Um, uh, overall survival, which is again similar. So yeah, like you said, I, I think we've got to be very selective in who we're offering this to at this point in time, but I, I certainly think there is a role for it. We just need to figure it out. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. So our next presentation is from uh, Dr. Matias from uh, Project uh, Czech Republic. Uh, this is one of the real benefits of the International College of Surgeons that we have uh, individuals from uh, other sections that are able to join in. So thank you very much for making the uh, long journey to the Czech Republic. Thank you for the uh, invitation to Texas. And uh, I would like to say a few words about the importance of uh, nutrition in patients undergoing surgery for GIG tumor. Uh, I have uh, no conflict of interest. And uh, uh, I must say that uh, there are malnutrition and surgery, it's problem. But malnutrition and surgery and oncological disease, it's different, but it's biggest problem. And uh, uh, because there's problem with infection, disorder of dealing, oncological treatment, intolerance, incomplete oncological treatment, very often worse response to tumor to chemo and radiotherapy, and of course, low quality of life. Uh, malnutrition is uh, very uh, fun, and according to American Society for Palka and Malnutrition, its incidence is uh, in 60% of patients with upper GI tumor and almost 70% of patients with uh, pancreatic cancer. And generally, its incidence in more than 40% of all oncological patients. The 
Look at Shama. If I must say that I am not certain, I'm sorry. I am only enthusiast that my view is maybe different from your view, but I am sure that we have the same interest and we have the same patience. And nutrition is not so effective for surgeon, but it's very important for our patients. And uh, malnutrition is often a more serious problem than the histological type of tumor at its stage. Uh, and uh, one of our colleagues, uh, is the president of Czech Surgery uh, Society, said that well-performed surgery is, of course, amazing and very important, but it's uh, just one of the many factors on which the services of the treatment depends. Stratification of uh, malnutrition is according to numeric risk score, and we calculate points at the first table is points for uh, nutrition state. And the second table is a point for risk of emerging from oncological disease and its treatment. As a high nutrition risk, uh, as uh, presence of at least one of the following criteria: weight loss more than six months, body mass index under 18, nutritional risk score more than five, or albumin under 70 grams per liter. And uh, this is this is uh, seen that we must prepare patient for surgery. And uh, prevention is more effective and cheaper than treatment of complications. Complications degree the effect of treatment. Uh, he is seen who is our typical patient. It is not men on the right side. Uh, our patient with uh, oncological disease are uh, very often patients. They are exhausted. They are malnourished, uh, often vomit, lose weight. They are after immunosuppression, chemotherapy. A surgeon made uh, resection and uh, anastomosis. We can quite progressive healing. And I uh, must say that the question is not whether to provide nutrition or not. The question is what, when, and how much should we provide. Uh, the, uh, we abide the recommendation by American or European society, the, the recommendations. We the nutrition on time and know when complications arise. And the bigger deficiency in the beginning, it means longer recovery. It is the recommendation of American society. And it's, uh, this slide uh, compares the, the recommendations of European and American society. It's nutrition preparation before operation. You can see that there are not big, there are not big differences. And nutrition preparation decreases the frequency of non-infection complications from 40 to 10 percent. But uh, preparative preparation is not only nutrition; it's also metabolic uh, preparation and also complex as a uh, exercise, eating rehabilitation of course, pharmacological optimization and relaxation techniques. And what to do after surgery? The day of operation is not important for nutrition. We don't use nutrition day of operation. The day we use for uh, stability of circulation, stability of bleeding, uh, uh, hemostasis, and also hydrovenous stability. And with the nutrition, we start since the second day post-operative, we use uh, only low dose of nutrition, 50% of calculated need. And this dose we uh, increase slowly to full dose uh, is after five or seven days. And enteral nutrition is increased according to the maturity of uh, GIT. This is a recommendation of American Society for Enteral Nutrition. This also, I think that is not necessary to uh, read it. Uh, my recommendation is uh, think about enteral nutrition after operation. And if it is not uh, contraindication, do it. The, 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 if we use uh, the tube uh, uh, by X ray scan or by endoscopy or during operation, uh, the, we have two uh, both, uh, 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 rules. The first is that the, the distal end of the tube must be under uh, anastomosis or under distal. 
and uh, we need uh, minimally one meter of uh, health intestine to quality, uh, quality nutrition. And this is a recommendation for parental nutrition of preparation. Dose of energy, uh, there is a very, very large window from 12 to 25 calories per gram and day. Dose of protein, again, a very uh, large window from 1 to 2 grams per kilogram and day. If it's, what is better, parental or parental nutrition? Recommendation is that is the same. And uh, use spawn, uh, supporting parental nutrition during the first week after operation. Recommendation is, is not important. This, this uh, I can say that in Europe it's the same. And now uh, we use also oil for nutrition, and the uh, question is uh, mixture oils or only bean, soya bean oil. In America, is recommendation you can use oil soya bean oil, there is no difference. In European, we recommend a mixture of oils. And uh, question 5b uh, is important to use fish oil for uh, nutrition of our patients. American recommendation is it is not important. European recommendation is uh, use fish oil. Those of uh, energy, I said that it's a very uh, a large window. And uh, in the acute phase, uh, uh, during catabolism, uh, we use only a low dose, 12, 15 calories per kilogram a day. And during anabolism, uh, we increase dose to 70, 75 calories per kilogram a day. Preoperative dose is 25 or 70 calories per kilogram a day. Uh, this uh, slide shows the energy load by phase of uh, healing. And uh, sugars are a very important part of uh, nutrition. Dose of glucose is 3 or 4 grams per, kilo, per kilogram water weight and day. Uh, risk of overdose is, of course, tartosis and overproduction of COT. Uh, we use insulin continually, even in non diabetic patients. We don't use tight correction of glycemia, we use loose correction of glycemia. Uh, protein, uh, preoperative dose is recommended 1.5 grams per kilogram a day, and postoperative again dose is slowly uh, increasing according to the uh, phase of illness, comorbidity, and duration. If patient has uh, liver failure, it's strictly recommended to use only branched amino acids. Uh, oil preoperative dose is uh, 1 to 1.2 uh, uh, grams per kilogram a day. Postoperatively, again, dose is slowly increased to 1.5 uh, grams per kilogram a day. Oil surplus is a risk of either S, uh, coagulopathy, liver enzyme, elevations, and immunosuppressions. Uh, we must say that oil is indispensable source of energy during stress and is crucial for healing. And oil is source of anti inflammatory mediators in critical care. And in Europe, we recommend multi component oil emulsions with uh, olive oil and uh, enriched with uh, omega 3 uh, non uh, uh, saturated uh, fatty acids. Optimal ratio of uh, omega 6 to omega 3 uh, unsaturated fatty acids is uh, 2.5 to 1. And uh, ideal uh, lipid emulsion in Europe is 70% of soy oil, 70% of coconut oil, 25% of olive oil, and 15% of fish oil. Micronutrients are vitamins, for example, like vitamin C and E are as antioxidants. Vitamin D is important uh, for healing. Trace elements, for example, selenium, very important in sepsis treatment. Immunotrains are glutamine, aranine, antioxidants, and omega-3 unsaturated fatty acids. And uh, there are very important for the treating of fistula, abdominal catastrophe, short bowel, short bowel syndrome. Jungle and San is uh, now uh, intensely from Brussels, and uh, we discussed about uh, uh, nowadays, uh, studies they are very short, and they ask is uh, 
consumption of antibiotics, length of ICU stay, length of artificial ventilation, and what is doing, what is happening with patient labor. It's a and uh, my uh, department uh, cooperated on the big uh, Euro parental nutrition study. It was in uh, 2020. It was a long term uh, study, and uh, there are, from it, there are three important results. The first, better uh, outcome is uh, in group if patients were well preparated by nutrition before operation, minimally one week, better 10 days. Second is that better uh, uh, outcome was in the group where after operation dose of energy and uh, uh, protein was low. You hear what? It was slow and it was slowly increasing. And third is better uh, follow up or better better uh, outcome was in the group where patients were uh, have had a good uh, rehabilitation. Luciano Gattinoni, uh, known uh, intensivist from Italy, and uh, our colleague very often asks, we want new evidence-based medicine, we need more guidelines, but for everything we can't have guidelines. Uh, evidence-based medicine shouldn't kill the medical people. And uh, he said uh, well, some provocative question, how many patients died? while why we are waiting for evidence. What to say is a conclusion. We must use individual approach to our patients, but in framework of functional system. Respect recommendation of nutritional societies. Begin nutrition on time, not when complications arise. Uh, calculate cumulative energetic and protein record and use quality rehabilitation. Nutrition is not easy, but uh, I'm sure that it is not so difficult. We have enough uh, knowledge, we have experiences, we must use medical reasoning, and uh, it's uh, important to do relatively easy things as well as possible. Our aim is not the patient's discharge from the department, but his state in one or two years later, his recovery, ability to work, and over quality of life. Thank you for your attention. Papers are open for questions. As uh, we're waiting for uh, some to the mic, uh, I have a question. It's a really important topic and important uh, uh, discussion uh, as well. A lot of the patients we see, of course, are eligible for peak rehabilitation and have time to prepare for uh, an elective oncologic operation. But occasionally we have someone who is admitted, uh, has bowel obstruction or partial obstruction, and needs to have surgery in a relatively short period of time. What are your recommendations for nutrition uh, in terms of those individuals? Should we delay surgery for a week and differential nutrition? Yes. Should it we get operated sooner? Yes. It depends if it's possible to eat or not. If not, we use tube. If it's not possible to use tube, we use uh, parental preparation. And it was it will be minimally one week, better two weeks before operation. Uh, we yeah, and, and how do you decide how long? Are you looking at certain key parameters to decide the uh, uh, The surgeon call uh, intensivist to uh, his ambulance, and uh, intensivist uh, exam patient and decide what will be the procedure. What will be A fantastic presentation, thank you. I, I think this uh, nutrition that you just brought up is one of the core critical values of surgery. And I say that I've been doing surgery since 1984. And what I've seen through the various programs, including trauma, plastic surgery, EMT, cancer, is the individual who we see here in the United States, at least the last 20 years, have been paying attention to this. Yes, we have a state of malnutrition in micronutrients in the United States. What I mean by that is people who eat McDonald's and KFC may have a large BMI, but they are not healthy. And now in my plastic surgery practice, where I see individuals 
is I draw labs, and the labs that come back consistent regardless of patient's weight or overall affect is a more or decreased total protein and albumin. And when I differentiate that into micronutrients, people are low in their core vitamins, B12, blood, blood, zinc, selenium. And I think this directly relates to their illness state, their weight gain state, their cholesterol metabolic state, and their wound healing abilities. So I can take someone who is relatively young and quote healthy, and they will not heal their wound, or more importantly, those who have predisposition genetically to keloid formation form keloids. And what I found was, and this came out of my burn care phase, uh, ICU days of micronutrition, I started looking at this and I came up with a cocktail that I give my patients they must take two weeks prior to any elective surgery. And that is a wound state vitamin, two daily. I give them vitamin 12 sublingual, 2,000 milligrams. 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C twice daily. Uh, vitamin D3, 800 international units, once a day. Calcium, 500 milligrams twice a day. Selenium, 10 micrograms um, twice a day. Zinc, 300 milligrams twice a day. And then I put them on protein, whey protein isolate. And it's simple because here in the United States, a scoop is, you put it on the back, but mostly it's 30 grams per scoop. They take two shakes a day. They do the surgery, and then they double this for the next two weeks. And I'll tell you, those doctors that I see with what I call failed bowel process or dehiscence, all their patients are out of the regimen and they are micronutrient deficient. So I think you're right on. Thank you. Can you go, can you go to that one? I, 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 I'll, I'll, if you have alcohol, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. I question that the other four people do I do my Yes. And I do the switch and DPS and all this kind of stuff. And we put us in my Yes. Yes. Yeah, they'll spend about. So, so a bag of protein is going to cost them about $30, right? The uh, multivitamin generic at Trader Joe's or CVS, eight bucks. The B12 is a little bit more expensive, especially if it's a sublingual. But all the rest is selenium, but only eight bucks. So you're right. So they can spend about 60 bucks. Yeah. But I tell them, do you want to spend time, money, effort, pain on having a wound dehiscence? Or do you want to be that person that walks out here with the grade? So spend the 60 bucks. And if they can't afford 60 bucks, they should not be looking at me to do their surgery, right? Now, you brought up a good point, the bariatric patients, those people have gone through weight loss, especially like the rule and why, those people are significantly micronutrient deficient. And for those people, before I do a paniculectomy or do a massive surgery on them to reduce their, 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 their state of being, they must, for about four weeks, undergo, and I check their labs regularly. Which again, they have to pay cash because their insurance is going to pay for it. Weekly lab tests, and that's another 20 bucks, right? Okay. So again, my topic's a little skewed, but I think your point, your lecture, is right on. Thank you. Okay, I, I think that uh, it's uh, very uh, interesting and uh, very difficult to answer something. Uh, we must say that uh, patients after traumatic is different category, no? And uh, because patient uh, and the trauma yesterday had steak, he has had very quality nutrition, he had steak yesterday. And uh, we know that the patient can be without nutrition five days and nothing happens. But it's important that yesterday he had quality nutrition. It's traumatic patients, a different category. And uh, uh, cancer, the patient is with cancer, and, uh, in, uh, especially the cancer on the upper uh, GIT, it's, uh, they are in the high risk, they are malnourished, they are in less weight, and uh, they hadn't stayed a lot of weeks, maybe months. Sometimes, and the nutrition is very, very different. And uh, to uh, serve the micro nutrition, recommendation <coughs> in Europe is if it, uh, I must say that in the internal nutrition, micronutrients are they are inside the, the, the preparate for internal nutrition contains micronutrients, vitamins, trace elements. 
but preparates for parental addition, they don't contain micro uh, elements, uh, vitamins and uh, place elements. We must add it. And recommendation is if you use parental nutrition, add micro nutrients. It's because the patients with cancer is a different, different category. And for example, bariatric patient is again different category. It's very, very difficult to calculate the nutrition, but recommendation is calculate it on, on the uh, absolute weight. Calculate it on the ideal weight. It is different. We use adjustable weight. Adjustable weight is ideal weight and one quarter of difference between ideal weight and his weight. Twenty-five percent above ideal weight. Yes. On it, calculate the nutrition for bariatric patient, and uh, recommendation is to use protein and protein and protein if it's possible. Two grams per kilogram, because uh, patient with uh, obesity have uh, problems with protein. They have big weight, but all healing is only from muscles. Only protein we can use for healing. Only muscles. And they haven't muscle, they have fat. Yes. For them is definitely those two grams per kilogram and weight and a day of protein. Lower dose of sugar, lower dose of uh, oil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organization for allowing us to present our work. Um, I, I, first of all, uh, we're going to be talking about combining medical insurance type and residential travel distance to our cancer center to determine their effects and outcomes. Uh, but don't let the, uh, the title of doing this in patients with robotic assisted pomegranate for lung cancer distract you. Some people would say that uh, this procedure selects for certain types of patients. But uh, I would uh, uh, beg to differ that the only selection for this procedure is that the tumors have to be less than eight centimeters. But we did not select by stage. We operate on both stage one, two, and three A, including multi-station media style nodal uh, disease. And uh, it, we even operate on patients uh, who had uh, morbid obesity, and advanced uh, age in their 80s and even in their 90s. This just happens to be the, the population that we have the most data on, since 75% uh, of our patients undergo this procedure for lobectomy for lung cancer. This is my disclosure. I've been a, um, a uh, robotic thoracic surgery observation site in Proctor for intuitive surgical. So, uh, lung cancer did. One moment, it looks like we lost our connection. Ah. So just a little bit of statistics. In the United States, we have approximately 170,000 new uh, cancer ca uh, lung cancer cases diagnosed each year, and 128,000 patients die of lung cancer each year. 
which accounts for about 350 deaths per day. If you extrapolate this uh, worldwide, there's about 2 million lung cancer deaths a year worldwide, which translates to about 5,500 uh, deaths per day or about four deaths from lung cancer uh, each minute worldwide. Now, 40% of lung cancer cases are uh, potentially resectable. Now, medical oncologists would say only 40%. And, uh, and this, uh, this is, again, a mix of stage one, two, and three lung cancer. Um, and uh, overall, the, the cure rate for lung cancer for all stages combined is only about 14 to 16 percent. While a surgeon would say 40 percent are resectable and, and hopefully more, especially now that we can offer resection to more patients with minimally invasive uh, lung resections. And now it's been recently shown that even sublobar resections uh, can be as good as the lobectomy for early stage lung cancer. Now, social determinants of health have been shown to impact outcomes. And this not only includes uh, age, advanced age, but in income, which includes insurance type, uh, patients living in rural areas, their employment status, their uh, education level, their social status as far as whether they're married or living with their family or living alone, and whether they belong to uh, social groups such as churches and so forth. So we're, we're gonna focus mainly on insurance type as well as distance from our cancer center where we've shown each of these to have uh, independent uh, predictors of outcomes where if you just look at insurance type alone, patients with private insurance do better than patients with public insurance, which includes Medicaid and Medicare, and those with combination insurance, which is mainly Medicare with private supplementation, have intermediate outcomes. As far as distance, we've shown that patients who live uh, more than two hours from the cancer center do better than patients who live within two hours of our medical center. Now, please don't confuse distance from our medical center as uh, a surrogate for rurality. In Florida, so our cancer center is in Tampa, and if someone said that they live in Miami, that lives, that's four hours away, certainly more than 100 miles or 160 kilometers, but certainly that's not a rural uh, community. So here we're just focusing on distance, which should translate to travel time, the cost of gasoline, the cost of having to have a hotel reservation if you're having appointments early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Um, so it, it's not really a surrogate for rurality. In this study, we actually looked at uh, the effects of combining both insurance type and the travel burden on outcomes uh, after pulmonary lobectomy. So uh, um, from September 2010 to March 2022, uh, I performed uh, over 700 consecutive uh, robotic pulmonary lobectomies. These patients were then uh, retrospectively analyzed and divided into six groups. They were first divided by their insurance type, again, private combination and public insurance, and then further divided into distance from uh, the cancer center. And we used uh, 160 kilometers or 100 miles as a cutoff uh, to divide the patients. And this has been performed in other studies at other uh, institutions. Uh, of course, a p-value of uh, 0 0.05 was uh, uh, used as significant, and we used first uh, comparative analysis, then univariate analysis to do multivariable logistic regression, as well as survival analysis. 
So these are just a couple of myograms for the various groups. It does get a little bit busy, but the, the, the uh, summary of this is that uh, for the patients with less than 160 mile distance from the medical center, they tended to do better than those who live uh, greater than 160 miles for all of those three insurance groups. And for any given distance, the patients with private insurance did better than those who had combination insurance. And uh, this is, uh, was proven at 100, uh, sorry, at uh, five year overall survival. So then uh, we just did pairwise comparisons to uh, determine which uh, pairs showed significance. And if we just looked at the private insurance patients who lived within 100 miles or 160 kilometers of a medical center, they did better than all groups who lived more than 160 kilometers from the cancer center, and also better than the patients who had who lived less than 160 kilometers but had a combination of insurance. Uh, and then patients who had who lived less than 160 miles, regardless of insurance type, did better than patients who lived greater than 160 kilometers from a cancer center, regardless of insurance type. And then the patients with combination insurance, regardless of distance from the cancer center, did worse than uh, the uh, uh, private or public insurance who lived less than 160 kilometers. And finally, patients with combination insurance who lived greater than 160 kilometers did worse than patients who lived 160 kilometers or more, but had public or private insurance. When we did the univariate analysis, these were the variables that were, uh, were found to be uh, uh, significantly different between uh, those uh, groups. But when we did multivariable analysis, our, our uh, study subgroups, which is the combination of uh, the insurance type and distance, was a significant uh, independent predictor of outcomes, while preoperative atrial fibrillation, estimated blood loss during surgery, conversion to thoracotomy, whether urgent or uh, elective, and postoperative mucus plugging that required bronchoscopy were also independent predictors of outcomes. So in conclusion, the effects of uh, increased travel burden combined with having either public or combination insurance type was a disadvantage to the patients, uh, which was more than either separately. And patients who lived closer to the cancer center and had private insurance did better, uh, had better outcomes than just having one of those uh, independently. And this importance of having a, 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 a combined effect of both insurance and uh, travel distance, as well as other social determinants of health, should be focused upon when uh, treating these patients, um, you know, regardless of their insurance type or, or distance. One of the things we do for patients who live further away, regardless of their insurance, of course, is as was mentioned earlier for the rural uh, lectures, was that we try to combine uh, their testing for their preoperative testing, for example. Uh, we try to do it one day, and if that's not possible, at least two days together uh, with, a, uh, with a medical discount given for um, a hospital stay during the intervening night. Uh, alternatively, we try to schedule cases on the week, uh, not the cases, but the pre-op testing on the weekends where it's, there's less traffic, so that doesn't compine, uh, compound their travel time on top of just distance, also having to deal with traffic. And then we then offer virtual uh, visits to review those test results and do further counseling prior to, prior to surgery. Um, and of course, related to uh, social determinants of health is also nutritional status as we discussed earlier. And uh, we also provide discounted um, 
uh, protein supplementation at our, at our facility's pharmacy. Uh, our pharmacy, for example, uh, offers uh, boost supplements to the patients at a 70% discount to a similar pharmacy outside of our campus. So, and then we recommend that they drink uh, protein supplements uh, for five days prior to surgery and then have a electrolyte drink the night prior to and uh, the morning of surgery. And we've shown that that decreased their hospital stay by at least one day and decreases their complication rates. All right, um, thank you for your attention. And uh, if there's any questions. I'll start out. Um, thank you for that excellent presentation. So, um, one of the things I notice in my practice is that the patients um, who do live a little bit far away um, from our offices, they may not interact as often with our, our practice, even though the lower shock a lot with portals and those sort of things. Is that something that you see going on between the two practices and very complicated differences in outcomes that you're seeing? Yeah, what we're finding is that we, we've set up a, a hotline to the clinic where patients can call in. First, it goes to a uh, facility hotline and then it gets triaged to our clinic hotline. And we dedicated two nurses where they answer questions that patients call. And then uh, if necessary, those get escalated to either our ABPs or uh, the faculty like myself. And we noticed that um, with patients who live a greater distance, they tend to uh, call more, which we, uh, we encourage, of course, um, but it does uh, increase the need for resources to handle those, those calls. And then, and then uh, we either, we also provide, like for example, I'll provide my email, uh, or we can just go through the portal and exchange messages through the portal. So we have uh, a variety of avenues that patients can reach us, especially if they live in this distance. Uh, so I our country is small and uh, from each village is to for a six surgery for less than 100 kilometers, that's from 70 miles. And uh, the insurance uh, to these days is everything for all patients free. We have general insurance and everything is free for them. And uh, do you remember our first president after the revolution, Václav Havel? He uh, had cancer of the lungs uh, and he was operated uh, and uh, uh, he asked uh, for the surgeon how is it to operate president and he said for me it's the same if I operate president uh, or homeless. That's right, and yes. Uh, yeah, we... Nowadays, nowadays uh, it will be a problem because uh, our uh, health debt, uh, our budget is in decreasing and decreasing and our politicians discuss what we will do next year politicians and ideas and social organizations and i think it's a very uh, very socially sensitive situation and uh, how to do it to to keep the social peace it will be very interesting and very very sensitive to what in our country yeah thank you for the question yes yeah, we get called all the time uh, and asked to see, for example, executives or, well, you know, VIPs, very important people. Uh, but, you know, we say every, every patient is a very important person, right? So we, we treat them the same. Um, but these other things that we, we cannot control from the institution side are the social determinants of, of uh, health. You know, they come with us uh, already with certain types of insurance, but even those uh, types of insurance are really surrogates of other social determinants of health. For example, the combination insurance compared to our public insurance patients. So the public insurance are a mixture of Medicaid and Medicare. So Medicare are uh, usually our older patients, whereas Medicaid are more indigent patients. You know, they're unemployed, they don't have their own you know, employer's insurance. Um, 
or they're at near the poverty level, so they get public insurance. Uh, and at, at, at our institution, if someone has no insurance, we actually have charity insurance that our institution covers. Um, and, and we can do that because uh, even my own insurance, my health insurance, is actually under, underwritten by my institution. So even though we go through a uh, private insurance company as the administrator, the money comes from our institution. So, so uh, once the patient is insured, then in, in theory, they shouldn't matter, right? Their, their service gets paid. But, but like I said, those are, uh, those are really surrogates of other things. So the combination insurance, most of those are Medicare patients. So they're all older patients just happen to have a supplement. Whereas patients with private insurance tend to be younger. They're going to be in their 50s and 60s. They're still employed for the most part. Uh, they may still have families, whereas the older patients may be uh, older, uh, the elderly that are living in an assisted living facility or independently with no family. So there are other things besides just the fact what kind of insurance they have or the distance that they live in. Because like as, as I mentioned earlier, distance, it could be that they live a distance away, but they, but they live in the countryside and don't have a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, a, uh, a safety net hospital near them, whereas others live a distance away, but they live in a city like Miami and have plenty of hospitals that they can go to if they got in trouble. Mm -hmm. Next presentation is uh, by Dr. Tyler Mao, who is an assistant professor of surgery at uh, Texas Tech, uh, and I love it. Uh, he's going to be speaking to us about uh, IPEX and penicillin colorectal disease. And uh, uh, he had mentioned that uh, he had performed the uh, first uh, IPEX ever in love it, and perhaps in that entire region uh, recently. So it's uh, uh, also perhaps an experience of how to set up a IPEX center. I want to thank everybody for having me and for the, uh, the society for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I have no disclosures. So um, since this is a, a, I guess, a general surgery um, type of conference, a little bit of background, which may be reviewed for some of you. Percussion mitosis is the clinical syndrome that arises from peritoneal dissemination of uh, intra-abdominal malignancy, uh, typically um, from visceral uh, uh, adenocarcinomas uh, or mucinous tumors. Uh, here we've got a CT scan demonstrating the classical mental caking and intraoperative findings um, showing the same. Uh, there's a bit of alphabet soup associated with this talk, and that's uh, because when it comes to the different appendiceal, specifically the appendiceal tumors, so we need to be very clear and precise with what we are talking about uh, and which uh, clinical entities are uh, leading to this syndrome. Um, this includes uh, both low and high grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms. Uh, this, these would be contrasted against things like appendiceal mucinous adenocarcinomas, uh, non mucinous adenocarcinomas, and signal ring cell cancers, uh, and then additionally colorectal um, carcinomas, which uh, even they have a spectrum of histologies. However, uh, for the purposes of this talk, they will be lumped uh, primarily together. Uh, the objectives to talk about today uh, will review the current data on cytoreductive surgery and high tech in the um, low grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms, or high grade for that matter as well and uh, colorectal cancers. Uh, we'll discuss the completed uh, randomized controlled trials in uh, cytoreductive surgery and high tech. Uh, and we'll also highlight some important deficiencies in the literature. And then we'll uh, end with uh, talking about a reasonable approach to these patients in the clinical setting. So appendiceal mucinous neoplasms, AMN, uh, irrespective of their low grade or high grade designations, uh, these are encountered incidentally in about a quarter of 1% of uh, appendectomy specimens. Uh, when these perforate, they can result in the widespread uh, in widespread peritoneal involvement. Uh, this is the classic jelly belly um, that uh, people sometimes talk about, uh, which is the uh, syndrome known as sumosomal peritoneal. This has an incidence of about one to two per one million uh, person years. Uh, 
early studies in this problem have demonstrated that surgery alone was just insufficient. Right? These patients had early, um, early uh, recurrences and progressions, which led to downstream problems. Uh, this is an intraoperative uh, picture. This is actually the, the first patient that we did in Lubbock, Texas. This is not me operating. This was a, uh, a call for help that I got from one of our dynamic uh, providers while, our, uh, while he was in the operating room. Um, so AMNs and uh, pseudomyxoma, uh, these uh, are by definition non-invasive. Now this terminology is somewhat controversial. Um, that's because the pathologist may describe something called a pushing invasion, but the key for, this, for these entities is that they are not infiltrated as uh, compared to something like a um, adenocarcinoma or, um, or other invasive uh, or infiltrative histologies. These come in a uh, low grade and a high grade version. Uh, the biggest difference between the two is the amount of cellular akithia. Here on the lower image, you can see the high grade, which tends to have cribriforming, where you've got the epithelium crawling all over itself, uh, and increased cellular akithia. The hallmark for both of these is still a lack of infiltration. If there's any degree of infiltration, these get reclassified as adenocarcinomas. Because of this, there's essentially no hematologic or lymphatic metastatic potential, and that becomes important for them. These are contrasted against the appendiceal adenocarcinomas. Uh, these include mucinous adenocarcinomas, the non-mucinous or classic adenocarcinomas and signet breeding histologies. These by definition do exhibit an infiltrative uh, behavior and therefore do have metastatic potential. For studies uh, regarding the management of these appendiceal tumors, spe specifically the uh, non-infiltrative versions of these, We've got numerous prospect, or, sorry, retrospective and quasi-prospective studies. I say quasi-prospective because the hot topic lately in this arena has been prospectively uh, enrolled or prospectively maintained retrospective databases, which, which really is just a fancy way to say we're still doing retrospective studies. Um, we have no uh, prospective randomized data to guide our therapy, uh, but there is a general consensus for these that uh, there is limited role for systemic chemotherapy. Uh, the ideal treatment is a complete cytoreduction and then a perfusion with the IPEC. Uh, and then there may be some role for palliation in patients who cannot be completely cytoreduced in terms of controlling uh, their symptomatic uh, mucinous societies. Taking these all into consideration, in my mind, the way that I approach these, uh, there's a spectrum of disease. Uh, the spectrum is really set up based on uh, tumor behavior with regards to the amount of neovascularization, uh, tissue invasiveness, and then again, systemic met uh, metastatic potential. As you move along this continuum, you tend to see a increasing benefit to systemic chemo as you're on the lower ends of the spectrum. Uh, there tends to be limited to maybe perhaps even no benefit to systemic chemo. Conversely, conversely moving along this, uh, you start to see uh, increased benefit to set reduction high tech on these lower, uh, uh, lower invasive histologies with uh, that benefit to high tech decreasing or diminishing as you move into the more invasive and more um, systemically active disease types. Um, there are a number of trials that are ongoing. This image is a little bit old. There are a few of these trials that have completed and have reported the results by now. But in general, we have a lot of various uh, prospective studies that are still underway and a lot of data that we're waiting on to really inform how we, how we manage these patients. In terms of completed trials, uh, we have only a few to talk about. Uh, one of the things that uh, was looked at, and these are specifically in colorectal cancers, are uh, prophylactic IPEX. Now these would be in high-risk patients, perhaps either perforated uh, colon cancers or even just T4 tumors. Uh, we have the Colopec and the Prophylochip trials. Uh, the long and the short of these is that these were negative. There was no benefit to prophylactic IPEC in these studies. There are two therapeutic site reduction IPEC um, studies, uh, which we'll actually spend a little bit more time talking on. This would be the Verwal publication in uh, 2003 and their update in 2008, and then the uh, Prodigy or Prodige, depending on your, your region, uh, the Prodigy 7 trial, which came out in 2021. Uh, starting with the Verwal study in 2003, uh, this included 105 patients. These were randomized to cytoreduction reduction in HIPEC with mitomycin C. All of these patients then went on to get adjuvant uh, 5-FU. Uh, the control arm was definitive 5-FU, uh, which included 51 patients. This study excluded all uh, prior or neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so they were not eligible for the study if they had been treated systemically before. Uh, median survival was 22 versus uh, 12 months, which showed a benefit, a statistically significant benefit in favor of HIPEC. They also published a, an update in 2008, which showed a 45% five-year survival, 
specifically in the patients who had a complete or adequate cyto reduction. So this would be the R1, which corresponds to a uh, completeness of cyto reduction score, a CC0. Uh, meaning all, uh, all macroscopic diseases were selected, uh, not leaving only um, microscopic disease behind. Uh, these are the survival curves from that particular study. One of the things, again, that's been repeated in a number of prospective studies in other disease sites is that the degree of cyto reduction, shown here on the right side uh, of the screen, uh, seems to play a very significant role in how patients do. Uh, we're going to contrast this with the newer study, the Protege 7 trial. Um, this included 265 patients, all with uh, colorectal cancer and carcinomatosis from that. They included uh, patients only with a uh, perineal uh, carcinomatosis index of 25 or less. Uh, they did include other, uh, or sorry, prior treatments, new adjuvant treatments in this trial, uh, and they did not account for a washout period. All patients, uh, irrespective of when they received their uh, therapy, were going to receive six months of chemo. They were randomized to cyber reduction plus high tech uh, with oxaliplatin uh, and concurrent IV 5 fu versus cyber reduction alone. Uh, again, this is independent of the either neoadjuvant, um, adjuvant, or mixed chemotherapy that they would receive uh, in total up to their six months on, on protocol. Uh, they demonstrated, or they found that there was no significant difference between uh, these two groups, uh, 41.7 months versus 41.2 months uh, in terms of uh, overall survival. Uh, there's a few things to talk about with this trial that I think are important. Uh, the major uh, issue that I see, or the major issue in my mind, is that uh, about 83 percent of patients in both arms were not treatment naive at the time of uh, at the time of their intervention. Uh, these were patients that were receiving uh, intravenous or systemic oxaliplatin based therapy, and then they were exposed again to intraperitoneal oxaliplatin. Uh, and this is the overall majority of their entire study cohort. Uh, overall survival benefit uh, was demonstrated in the mid-range PCI group, so the patients who had PCI scores of 11 to 15, um, despite this not being the primary endpoint, they did actually demonstrate an overall survival benefit to high tech. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind about this particular trial, there was no uh, non-surgical arm. This was not a cyto reduction versus uh, best or first-line chemotherapy trial. This was a cyto reduction plus perfusion versus cyto reduction alone trial. There have been conversations trying to use results of this trial to justify foregoing surgical consultation for patients with colorectal carcinomatosis. It would be inappropriate to use this particular trial in its findings to justify that action since this really makes no attempt to um, this really makes no attempt to evaluate the role of cyto reduction. It's really only perfusion that's being evaluated. So looking at, looking at these head-to-head, -head, um, major criticisms for the Verwall study, there was no modern systemic therapy. They were really all just on 5-FU at this time. This is before full FOX became standard. Uh, that's contrasted with the Project 7 trial, which uh, had systemic chemotherapy and modern systemic therapy, chemotherapy for everyone. Um, however, as we discussed, this was a saliplatin um, in a population that was going to be essentially dual exposed. The Verwall study used primarily open technique where there was not really meaningful control for the technique in the uh, Prodigy 7 trial. Um, with the exception of on protocol, they had a uh, relatively short, at least in the United States, uh, uh, perfusion time of only 30 minutes. Um, despite that, uh, they did demonstrate excellent survival, 40 plus months in both arms, and this would be compared to historic controls. So uh, the, one argument that has been made is that even if we are not including perfusion in these patients, the cyto reduction component still seems to be adding some benefit in this population. Uh, the final thing to keep in mind is that the Verwall study was a uh, surgery versus no surgery trial. It was evaluating the role of a, of a bundled cyto reduction in high tech, whereas the Project 7 trial is surgery versus surgery. It is looking specifically at the benefit conveyed by perfusion irrespective of uh, or with, with cyto reduction happening in both arms. Uh, so in, in summary, we have uh, reasonable, and maybe strong is too strong over here, but we have reasonable evidence that cyto reduction in high tech is better than chemotherapy alone. Uh, that's a composite statement based on the, both of the wall findings and this uh, sub-analysis in the uh, mid-range PCI group in Friday the 7. Uh, there's moderate evidence that the addition of high tech may not add benefit, and uh, they actually did demonstrate um, convincingly that there is increased morbidity to the uh, perfusion group. Uh, there was a signal for at least a biologic effect among this middle PCI group. Um, but the last thing that came out of this trial, at least that, uh, in, uh, that I took away from it, is that we have a expansive, what I'll call, no data zone that's being used to construct a lot of these trials. And I'll, I'll define it here in a second. 
So uh, with these trials, a lot of the debate that happens is uh, it comes down to how the high tech is being performed. There's a number of different technical considerations. It's not as simple as just hooking somebody up to an IV and you get 100% bioavailability throughout their, uh, you know, throughout their systemic effect. It's it's uh, it's really more about the technique of delivery to the intraperitoneal space. Uh, there are a number of things that we just choose based on very limited data. So our optimal temperature for the delivery is all based on in vitro studies. Drug choice and pharmacokinetics. These are primarily out of Dr. Sugarbaker's lab uh, from the I believe the 90s, um, and again mostly in vitro and some animal studies. Uh, some other things that come down to more nuanced aspects of the procedure: uh, complete versus selective peritonectomy. Um, we have really no studies for that. There are some centers where you won't do a uh, routine peritonectomy unless you see visible tumor in the area. Uh, and all other things, such as the use of fulguration uh, for unresectable or familiarity disease. Uh, many of us will do this, and I do this in my practice. Uh, I'll, I'll use the argon to take out uh, small tumors that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get to very well. Um, but we don't actually know how this should be incorporated into our calculation of the um, PCI score and whether or not this should be uh, should raise our completeness of site reduction score. Um, there's also the open versus closed technique, which has been evaluated a number of different ways. Um, usually, they are looking at secondary endpoints such as temperature. And then finally, the, the use of shaking I include here is, is kind of a shameless plug for some work I did in fellowship where. Uh, at least where I trained in residency, there was active debate on whether or not uh, shaking was even useful. Um, but we were able to demonstrate, at least in the pig model, that um, at least if you if you believe that the hyperthermia component matters, that you should be shaking because there is not only a dramatic but also a very immediate effect to temperature distributions. Uh, takeaway points for this: uh, It's difficult to interpret study results when there are so many uh, technical aspects of HIPEC that remain uncertain and really unstudied. Uh, any of these items within this no data zone uh, could lead to a technical failure of the procedure, even if the even if the biology and the theory behind it is sound. Uh, we do need a standardized and a well-controlled HIPEC technique across these trials before we can know how to interpret all these results. Uh, and then finally, the, there's reasonable evidence, at least uh, among uh, colorectal cancer patients, that there is still a role for cytoreductive surgery uh, in their care. Now, in my practice, I go back to this continuum that I mentioned earlier. Uh, when I see any of these patients, I am primarily interested in evaluating them for their risk of systemic versus regional failure. And that's, uh, that's the primary thing that I am focused on when I'm deciding what to do with them. For patients with uh, low-grade and high-grade nuisance neoplasms, um, I tend to offer uh, side reduction surgery and HIPEC only. Uh, there is a small consideration for systemic chemotherapy for the high-grade tumors, and that's mostly because I want or I worry that uh, perhaps pathology could have missed an area of microinvasion, and there may be some degree of uh, metastatic potential. But if we stick to the definition that these patients really should not have uh, any lymphatic or hematogenous spread and really don't, don't require any systemic therapy for that. Um, for patients with uh, these mucinous appendiceal tumors or adenocarcinomas, uh, these come in both high-grade and low-grade versions as well. Uh, those uh, I'll usually lead with uh, site reduction high pack uh, with a stronger consideration for adjuvant chemotherapy, usually 5-FU uh, versus full FOX. Um, for patients with the standard uh, adenocarcinomas of the appendix, colorectal cancers, and uh, especially signet ring cells, uh, I typically prefer to see uh, new adjuvant to full FOX in these patients. Uh, I'll routinely recommend it. Uh, and then we'll reevaluate after they've had several cycles to see whether or not they are a candidate. Now I will perfuse patients um, with colorectal adenocarcinomas and, uh, and uh, appendiceal adenocarcinomas. I, I typically favor the perfusion in patients who have a higher PCI and uh, multifocal familiarity disease. Uh, patients where you may have a, a harder time actually achieving your, your optimal side reduction. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Society and Drs. Uh, Laman and Santana for asking me to come down here and the numerous mentors that got up along the way and I'll uh, take any questions at this time. So uh, papers open for questions. Uh, I'll start off with the, uh, the first one. Um, you know, one of uh, really impressive results with the Reed 7 was that you know, whether or not you believe the high tech uh, results is the tremendous survival uh, side reduction. Mm -hmm. Uh, or survival, uh, overall survival. So, uh, of patients with perineal metastases, uh, colorectal perineal metastases, which one should get referred for surgery? All of them? 
from them? Or what, what do you advise your referring medical colleagues? Yeah, uh, if we're talking about the cider reduction now, I think there is there is a, a wealth of data, even if it's not super high level data, that um, we are really talking about peritoneal only disease. Uh, once we get into other uh, other uh, locations of metastasis, uh, the benefit starts to dwindle away really pretty quickly. So, uh, for patients who have tolerated uh, chemotherapy well, who have uh, resectable disease, because I really wouldn't consider one of these patients unless I was very confident that I could achieve a, a complete cytoreduction, reduction, um, and who have demonstrated favorable biology in response to their therapy, those are the ones that I think are, are best served by a, at least a surgical evaluation. I, I just like to add to that. I, I mean, I, at least personally, I say that. Uh, Basically, anyone who can talk to zero or one performance status and without black metastatic disease can probably see a surgeon of any sort of uh, metastasis, regardless of the number of sites. I mean, I think that's kind of where the field's going to hold, right? Like, and that's, I mean, that the disease is just so more than just one, uh, you know, good systemic options uh, that I, I think we as a society can get more surgeons involved early in that process. And uh, even if some patients don't get 30 cycles of chemo, we'll always see them. Great talk. I have two questions for you. Um, one, I, I was really uh, happy to see you decoupling high tech from CRS because, as you know, from the job boards and everything, mm -hmm. all of these positions are being listed as high tech surgeons. The data for high tech is not that strong overall. There was a set of kind of surgery, I think, there, you know, is a clear role now. Um, would you say that, uh, you know, in your practice, you were successfully getting uh, insurance to pay for high tech or? these indications because I, I do some high tech and I, I've run into a ton of trouble uh, with them saying this is all experimental therapy. That question is going to be a little hard to answer primarily because I am fairly new to practice. So uh, we uh, just started our program in um, in Lubbock, Texas. High tech uh, and cytoreductive surgery is something that I've been very passionate about throughout training and came to West Texas with the specific intent of starting the program. Um, but as, uh, as I think Dr. Mom had alluded to earlier, uh, we actually just got our first patient through about a month ago. Uh, I don't know actually what the insurance situation was with that one. Um, I'm not involved in that process. I have heard that there's uh, that there can be struggles, um, and it really comes down to having a, a strong um, a strong position to negotiate from from a, from a hospital or system standpoint. That seems to be a key to getting reimbursed for these things. What do you think is kind of the next step for this field? Is it, I mean, at least personally, we're opening two trials looking at uh, uh, NICAC uh, for placement um, and uh, intracranial chemo, kind of decouple uh, the chemotherapy from surgery to avoid all the complications we see with NICAC in both gastric and colon. I'm just curious what do you, you think the next step should be? This kind of touches on something I mentioned towards the end, um, that we we have a, uh, a smattering of different techniques and a lot of different things that people are looking at, and there's a lot of it that we don't know a lot of, um, enough about yet. Um, I tend to be kind of on the side of the fence that uh, if, we're, if we're stirring this up too much when there are so many moving parts, we may be designing trials that are doomed to fail for purely technical reasons. Um, it, there's a there's a Goldilocks zone in there somewhere, though. Like we have to be able to, to push and to innovate in order to make something like this work. But uh, we have to be careful with it, or at least be uh, be very realistic about what we find on the tail end. Uh, because again, there, there are so many um, technical uh, and, and really physical aspects to this procedure that uh, that I can't actually say are important because we don't, we don't know, we don't have the data for it. We all assume that it's important, but we, we actually don't know. Um, one other thing you had mentioned earlier that I just wanted to touch on was the decoupling of the cyber reduction and the high tech. Um, it, it is interesting that uh, through training and residency, you always call these the high tech patients, but that's really not the bulk of their operation. That's an hour and a half out of a frequently like 10 hour surgery where cider reduction and the quality of cider reduction is actually the single thing that has been demonstrated over and over again in respect to the disease site. We have it in uh, colorectal, we have it in uh, ovarian, very strong evidence, and I believe uh, there's some early evidence in gastric that quality of high, uh, cider reduction is probably the single most important factor in all of this. High tech. Uh, as you said, may not actually benefit, but it's still the cyber reduction that's been getting a lot of benefit, or if not most of the benefit. Nice talk, Ty. My question is uh, related to this um, getting the high tech started. What are the lessons learned for you uh, based on your first role in the first case? Oh, I'm sorry, say that again. What lessons did you learn from your first case in the program? 
But I guess I can actually tell the story of how it happened because it is a little bit uh, different than what we had planned. As I, as I showed in the thing, I get this, uh, this text message with a picture of a, of a classic jelly belly from one of our gynome surgeons who thought he was going into a ovarian tumor and found out that it was appendiceal. Um, we had been talking about some of our protocols and trying to get things into place, um, but had not actually finalized anything. And once we had a patient that was in the hospital and was otherwise ready to go, we were able to pull the trigger on all these. And it all just kind of fell into place. How much of that was luck, I don't know, but uh, we got the, the um, intra-op and, and primarily the post-operative uh, protocols are the ones that ended up being the biggest barriers to getting this done. Um, we got those to work and uh, we were able to pull the case off without any, uh, any big logistical purpose, which is really what I was most concerned about. Um, the, the thing, probably for starting a sort of program in high tech, the biggest thing that I learned is that you need to, you need to go up and down the ladder of uh, the care team and make sure that everybody, everybody on every rung is comfortable with what you're doing and has at least a rudimentary understanding of what's going on. Um, especially in the current uh, hospital climate, uh, there's a lot of different people that can essentially stop the presses. If they, uh, if they aren't on board with what's happening, you need to make sure that process is smooth uh, in order to get this done successfully. I figured I'd introduce myself, so I'll drop a follow on that. Search won't call this a D for Sierra Nebraska. I'm going to kind of chat a little bit about melanoma. Uh, I kind of pledged that the only thing I would talk about until July 1st was about EPAs or something about EPAs because it's such an important project on the board. But I allow myself to talk about melanoma because it's really my passion. So, uh, you know, there's been, been some, uh, melanoma seems like a very pedestrian uh, topic because, you know, we've been doing viable decisions for such a long time. And some of the vibes just seems kind of, uh, you know, uh, old news in a sense. But really, I think there's some advances that I think are worth us uh, reflecting on a little bit. So a couple of uh, uh, conflicts of interest. But, uh, so surgical excision, uh, primary treatment of melanoma, I think we all know this. Uh, rationale is unlike breast cancer uh, or uh, other malignancies, you need more than tumor on ink, right? You need to have a larger area. The, the theory on this is that the lymphatics are the way that melanoma spreads. Uh, so you need to capture the melanocytes that might be uh, have spread through those uh, lymphatics. And there have been a variety of margins that have been uh, used for melanoma. I've taken five centimeters, and you can imagine 15 centimeters. I, I can't even imagine those types of excisions in the past. But there were several trials, and I'm not going to go into any great detail in uh, more than a couple of these trials. Uh, but just to suffice this to say, they've looked at a variety of different margins. They've looked at for melanomas that are up to two millimeters of thickness of one versus a three centimeter margin, they found an identical disease to and overall survival. This study looked at uh, melanomas between 0.8 millimeters and two millimeters, uh, randomized to two and five centimeter margins, and showed no difference in recurrence to or overall survival. Uh, this trial, I think, is perhaps one of the more important ones. These are melanomas up to two millimeters, uh, or more than two millimeters of thickness. They did randomize to one and three centimeter margins, and this goes to question of do margins matter at all. And in this study, this is one versus three centimeter, you can see actually there was a difference, barely, of a uh, difference in local regional recurrence with a three centimeter margin being better than a one centimeter margin. Again, these are for thicker melanomas, melanomas that are two millimeters or thicker. Uh, not, did not quite meet a uh, recurrence rate or death uh, or overall survival, uh, but certainly demand a local regional recurrence uh, standard. These are the survival curves. They're not huge variances, uh, certainly not at all for overall survival. But as you can see, for local regional recurrence, there is a slight difference between the one centimeter and a three centimeter margin. Uh, and for melanoma specific survival, there's a small difference between a three centimeter and one centimeter margin. And then this is the final uh, kind of older trial. This is for uh, melanomas between one and four millimeters, randomized to two centimeters or four centimeters, and no difference in local recurrence or overall survival. A lot of trials, none of them that are perfect fit. So we took all of this data together, and this is a summary of where we came out. We said for melanomas that are less than a millimeter in thickness, one centimeter margin, greater than two millimeters in thickness, two centimeter margin, and for in between, we said we just don't know. <laughs> so that was kind of the summary. So uh, really, again, none of these trials are perfect, but there's certainly a suggestion that two centimeter margin for thicker melanomas might be useful. 
But not everyone believes that. And in fact, you know, this being the International College of Surgeons, I think it's worth reflecting on international practice. And you can see that, though that we do that in the United States, it's not true everywhere. Uh, and in fact, you can see in the Netherlands, that between up to two millimeters, they only do it in one centimeter margin. And in the United Kingdom, uh, at least in the 2010 guidelines, they do a three centimeter margin, which is what their trial was for melanomas that were thicker. Uh, so there are certainly not consistency in practice uh, throughout the world. So this was a, a trial that was uh, to answer that question. This is actually an ongoing trial. The United States is a, this international trial is known as S2015. Uh, it's accrued 3,000 patients essentially to a one centimeter versus a two centimeter margin uh, for if you have a T, uh, 2D or thicker uh, melanoma. So just a very simple trial. They actually did a pilot version of this trial uh, and they found out, not surprisingly, that the larger margin you take, the more likely you need to have reconstructive surgery and the more complications that you have. So just kind of interesting. So one of the questions I ask is, you know, patients have an opinion on this, right? When you ask them, you know, I'm gonna take this much or this much, they, they, they like to choose. So one of the questions that I had is would patients be willing to accrue to a trial like this in the United States? And I actually only randomized patients who are in that intermediate group where we didn't know uh, or our guidelines at least don't say whether a one centimeter or a two centimeter margin uh, is better. And so this was actually done while I was at the University of Kansas uh, over essentially uh, about, about an eight month uh, period of time. And again, these were intermediate thickness melanomas, one to two millimeters. I exclude some regions that I thought were not reasonable uh, to randomize. And what I found is, uh, interestingly, that only a third of patients or so were willing to be randomized which is not, you know, well, it's going to be my impression as well. Most patients who did not want to be randomized actually preferred to have the two centimeter margin. They kind of, they went by the philosophy that bigger is better, uh, so they wanted the two centimeter margin. So that really kind of helps to inform us as if we were to do a trial like this in the United States, that, you know, you saw that it was 3,000 patients to accrue to this trial. You kind of have to ask 9,000 individuals whether they thought they'd be willing to participate to accrue to a trial of 3,000 who would do it all in the United States. So this is that trial that I was mentioning earlier, the pilot version, uh, which we saw earlier, uh, which is S, called S2015, uh, or SWOG2015. And again, randomizing individuals who are had uh, stage 2A or uh, up to 2C melanoma, they all had a clinical exam that shows no nodal metastases. So these are all uh, stage 2 melanoma patients. Randomized either a 1 centimeter or a 2 centimeter margin, a very purely surgical trial. It's about a, about a pure surgical trial as you can get. The uh, primary endpoint for this is disease-free survival. Uh, the secondary endpoints, including local uh, recurrence, uh, being an endpoint. Uh, and these are other uh, exclusion and inclusion criteria. So again, it's two millimeters without ulceration, or uh, one millimeter with ulceration qualifies you for this trial. Uh, the follow-up is up to 10 years, but it's at least uh, five years. And again, uh, these are regular follow-up intervals that we would typically do for melanoma patients uh, anyway. Uh, these are preferred to be face-to-face -face visits, so during COVID, we decided to also make, make telehealth an option uh, as well. So it was activated uh, about a year ago. Uh, there are more than 36 sites now, uh, and uh, it's accruing quite well. Uh, since I made these slides, actually the accrual has more than doubled since then. It's accruing uh, tremendously. Uh, it's actively enrolled in the United States. It'll take a while before we have results. I imagine we'll have results for another uh, five, to 10 years, but certainly I think this is exciting that we'll uh, at least have some data. So more to come, but we'll probably be decreasing the margins that we need to for melanoma in the future. So we'll kind of go to uh, our next topic, which is uh, we're going to start talking about cell lymph node biopsy and, and actually what to do with nodal metastases. Uh, so cell lymph node biopsy, the, the standard recommendation is for anyone with a melanoma 0.8 millimeters or thicker uh, to have uh, a, a cell lymph node biopsy. But there is some controversy in regards to thinner uh, melanomas. And why is there the controversy? It's because there are a lot of thin melanomas. And by thin melanomas, I mean anyone that's really a, a T1 melanoma, one millimeter or less in thickness. And just because of the sheer number of uh, individuals with thinner melanomas, that they account for actually 29% of all melanoma deaths. We worry about the thicker melanomas, but a large number of melanoma deaths are actually from these individuals who typically don't qualify for uh, lymph node uh, staining. And, and this actually comes to help uh, inform us a little bit. You can see, uh, or a little bit hard to see, but you, the, this slide is really to make the point that not all thin melanomas are the same. Individuals who, have, who are younger have a much higher risk of 
lymph node metastases. So perhaps those individuals with thinner melanomas who are younger may benefit from having a simple lymph node biopsy versus not. For example, in this case, someone who has a T1A melanoma uh, who uh, is less than 40 years of age actually has a 15% chance of lymph node metastases, while someone who has a T1B melanoma who is greater than 65 years of age has only a less than 4% chance of lymph node metastases. Well, there's ways to help us out. This is actually a nomogram from uh, Dr. Quartz uh, alma mater from Memorial Sloan Kettering. You can plug in these numbers, so if you're visiting with a patient and want to uh, tell him or her their individual risk of having uh, a sentinel lymph node that's positive, so meaning having no disease, you can just plug this in. And this actually helps me inform my uh, discussion with my patients on whether or not they uh, might benefit from having a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And then it spits out what I would consider a, kind of a simple uh, way to discuss this with your patients. You can show this image to them or uh, help them interpret it. And you can say in this case, there's an 11% chance of having a lymph node metastasis. Uh, so again, an easy way to help inform uh, the discussion with your patients. Another kind of next step is what if they already have lymph node disease? Maybe they have palpable lymph node disease or, or sorry, what if they have sentinel lymph node disease already? Uh, you know, as we know, the kind of the dictum had been that if you have a positive sample lymph node in the past, that the automatic was to go ahead and do a completion of lymph node activity. That really got changed by this trial, which is MSLT2. MSLT2 randomized individuals to either have a completion lymph node a dissection, which is CLMD, or to just have serial ultrasounds, that be ultrasound at every three to four months, and then only have a completion dissection if they had the disease found on that ultrasound and then. Uh, and prior to dissection, percutaneously identified. What they found in this study is that comparing a completion lymphadenectomy up front versus active surveillance, that there was no difference in melanoma specific survival. Uh, and this just kind of reiterates that. In addition to that, no distant disease free survival. I'll have you look at the lower curve, the red curve, and the blue curve, which is really the more relevant one. Uh, so, no difference in distant disease free survival or metastatic disease. Uh, there were, of course, differences in disease-free survival, uh, meaning that individuals who did not have all their lymph nodes re uh, removed, a percentage of them, about 20% or so, ended up having, uh, having disease in those lymph nodes that then progressed and ended up having a lymphadenectomy. The point, of course, though, is that you can salvage those individuals by doing a lymphadenectomy later, and that also meant that about 70 to 80 percent of individuals never had to have lymph node dissections and didn't have to incur the morbidity of that surgery. So there's some considerations. I mean, there's still limited follow-up. We've got a little bit more follow-up since those curves came out. It is a kind of select patient population. Uh, it requires active surveillance. So someone that comes in and you know they're never coming back, then probably they need to have a, they, you should consider doing a lymphadenectomy because active surveillance is important and the only, the only way we're able to achieve those similar uh, outcomes is with active surveillance. And this trial was conducted in the era prior to effective systemic therapies, uh, so we don't want to uh, know what the effect of additive therapy is on this. And of course, we don't have, there is some limitation. We don't completely stage these patients uh, when we uh, defer lymphadenectomy. So uh, we'll have to see what the uh, lack of staging might, what that effect might be. Particularly since some of the additive therapies are really contingent on the level of staging. For example, a, a 3A melanoma sometimes doesn't receive additive therapy in the current therapy. Yeah. Did you do all the lymph nodes, all sentinel lymph nodes? If you do a lymph node, uh, yes. Or so, for the sentinel nodes, mm -hmm. if there was more than one sentinel node, you have to do all sentinel nodes, correct? Yes, yeah, yeah. You're, 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 in order to, uh, for the trial, you had to do a complete sentinel lymph biopsy. So if there were three or four or five, you would have to remove all the sentinel nodes. And if there was in multiple basins, you would have to remove all the sentinel nodes in all of those basins. I also think it's important, since we have an audience that probably does the breast cancer in addition to melanoma, uh, that there are some key differences between uh, Z11, which was of course the study that showed in breast cancer that you did not necessarily have to do lymphadenectomies. Uh, there uh, is no, was no standard adjuvant treatment in that study, unlike in breast cancer where they would all receive adjuvant radiation. Uh, we're still getting more survival data. Uh, and again, not all cancers are the same treatments are different. So that's just important that we don't automatically extrapolate our breast cancer data uh, to our melanoma data. Next, uh, just uh, going kind of to the next step, which is what if they already have nodal disease? Let's say that you have palpable nodal disease, they present to you in that situation. 
So there's been talk about doing neoadjuvant therapy uh, for uh, for nodal disease. And this was a really early trial. This is from 2018. And, and it's really a remarkable thing. This is several years ago. This is five years ago where they were already doing uh, new adjuvant therapy for, uh, for melanoma uh, with immunotherapy. This is from uh, MD Anderson. It really this is from the Mario study. And in fact, it showed that there were good responses. In fact, you can see that a sizable percentage of the individuals had a complete pathological response, uh, which is uh, those blue bars, particularly with combination of immunotherapy. And this just shows kind of some of those effects. And you can see that lymph node that the arrow is pointing to, dramatically reducing in size. And not only did it matter that it reduced in size, pathologically, when they evaluated that lymph node, uh, it was completely, all the disease was gone, uh, which is quite remarkable. So really showing a, a potential benefit for doing a, a completion of the <laughs> And you can see a difference in curves in progression-free survival, distant metastatic-free survival, overall survival, uh, the uh, red, red and blue being the difference between the uh, blue being the combination of immunotherapy and the red being the single agent and the map. So again, really showing a potential benefit for doing a neoadjuvant approach. This really came ahead with this trial, which reported out just this last year, which is SWOG 1801. Again, a very simple schema. Uh, this is a Dr. Patel study from uh, MD Anderson one through SWOG. Uh, looking at individuals who are resectable stage 3B or more disease, either getting adjuvant therapy or neoadjuvant therapy, uh, with pembrolizumab in this case. And they looked at the endpoint of event-free survival. This is just a little bit about the patients. There are 345 patients that enrolled, 313 that randomized, uh, about an equal number in either arm. And uh, every time I hear this presented, they talk about this, the difference between these curves enough to drive a truck between. You can see clearly that there's a difference between the neoadjuvant arm and the adjuvant arm. It clear superiority from an event-free survival uh, standpoint of getting neoadjuvant immunotherapy in palpable lymph node disease prior to lymphadenectomy versus doing it in the adjuvant setting. So certainly this is a game changer as well. And it, overall survival, we're not quite e there yet, but uh, certainly it's early. Uh, so uh, I look forward to these curves, I expect, diverging over time. So uh, considerations for neoadjuvant therapy, ideally doing it in a clinical trial, but I think with this data, you should consider doing it uh, for all of your patients. Uh, but it, it's also important that you don't do it indefinitely, uh, kind of like with our discussion of uh, liver metastases. You want to do it for a short interval, six to eight weeks. If you do it longer than that, there's a risk of progression and not no longer being surgical candidates. And with that, I'm going to briefly talk about regional chemotherapy for just a minute. This is for in transit disease, and uh, I'm, I, I'm still a believer in this. I know th those of you who have melanoma here are probably squinting and uh, kind of. Uh, furrowing your brows, wondering why anyone would still do this. But this is kind of like high tech, high dose, immuno, uh, high dose chemotherapy to a singular location. So it's regional chemotherapy, heated in a similar fashion to high tech, uh, but just treat this very challenging situation of in transit disease. And this is when you have multiple in transit metastases that are not amenable to surgical resection. They have no sites of distant disease. Uh, it, the location is critical. You have to be able to isolate the limb or arm to be able to put it on bypass. And essentially use a bypass surgery, just like we would uh, for uh, heart bypass, but instead you're putting a, a leg or an arm on bypass. This is a, a tourniquet, you can see the catheters going in, uh, and you want to cinch down the tourniquet so that chemotherapy doesn't go anywhere else but to that extremity. Let's see if this video works. This is more fun to be able to show videos. Uh, but it's just showing that you, I've wrapped this leg in a warming blanket, we have the catheters going in, and we have the tubing that's going to the bypass circuit, uh, and we're just pumping chemotherapy. Uh, for a 60-minute uh, time period. Uh, this is kind of the washout phase. So after we've done the chemotherapy for uh, an hour, I've walked now washing out the chemotherapy with saline uh, to, and then before uh, restoring circulation uh, to that extremity. And then uh, I'm able to save all that blood after exsanguinating the extremity, and we put it through a cell, uh, cell saver circuit and then reinfuse it into the patient. So they typically don't even need a transfusion after this, which is pretty remarkable. I, I initially uh, was skeptical about the safety of doing this, but uh, uh, frankly, you're able to wash out the entire chemotherapy and there's no evidence of uh, neutropenia typically in a situation after this. Response rates, I would say, for lymph perfusions are better than almost anything that we have in any other situation for melanoma. Uh, 85% uh, percent, uh, of uh, overall responses and nearly 60% uh, complete responses with a lymph perfusion. 
So uh, I think it's a, a tool to armamentarium and something to consider uh, for the program data. There, these are kind of the classifications of toxicities. And as you can see here for limb perfusions, which is what I typically do, very uh, no in this uh, meta-analysis is grade four or five uh, toxicity. The risk of amputation, which is what everyone fears, shouldn't happen uh, in a high volume center. So just in summary, uh, this whirlwind through uh, melanoma, uh, margins remain important, but they may be changing in the future as we uh, try to get to smaller and smaller margins. Uh, we're at the early stages of applying new evidence therapy. Uh, largely, they should be done as part of a clinical trial, but I think with S1801, I think many of us are venturing and starting to do that kind of almost a standard. Uh, though, uh, you know, I, I have to admit, it's not accepted by everyone, uh, and certainly NCCN still has not completely adopted it, but certainly worth considering doing it in an adjuvant setting. And then I, I believe that reading joint chemotherapy continues to have a role in selecting uh, patients. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. The each well, so in my practice right now, um, the sentinel lymph node biopsy is primarily driving the decision of whether or not to do a new checkpoint inhibitor setting or a new adjuvant setting. There's certain changes in the patients where they're including now higher stage two patients, um, the stage two C's. Uh, do you think that that changes or diminishes the role for sentinel lymph node biopsy in, in these uh, patient populations? Yeah, no, I think uh, that's a great question, Dr. Matt. So that, you're referring to Keynote 716, which uh, for stage two patients, uh, most, many of them uh, who are higher risk should be referred to an ethnologist to talk about adjuvant criminalizumab. So there's, a, yeah, that's a great question. Is it, do we need the central lymph node biopsy anymore uh, to inform that decision? I still do because I think it helps with prognostic information and it's also, it always in my mind, is the juice worth the squeeze. And frankly, I look at the central lymph node biopsy as a relatively minor procedure, all things considered, relatively normal, low morbidity, and it provides enough information, I think, to help uh, with prognosis. Additionally, I don't know, we don't know if a mini sentinel lymph node biopsy will have an outcome that we don't anticipate. For example, uh, you know, as we know with um, MSLT2, equivalence was only found because we were doing serial ultrasounds. Are we missing those individuals that we should be doing serial ultrasounds and we fail to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy? Uh, particularly in trunkal locations where we don't know what the appropriate lymph node basin is, I think randomly ultrasounding will be not feasible. We would have to be more targeted. Some individuals have talked about doing a lymphocytography and not doing the sentinel lymph node biopsy and just doing the serial ultrasounds in that area where the lymphocytogram brings. That might be an option to consider, but I would only do that as a part of clinical trial. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. For, for those patients receiving new adjuvant therapy, um, how are you evaluating, evaluating them surgically? Do you have some data on those patients? Like, do you have breast cancer? Like, how does that all translate to you? Yeah, so for the seven one, currently the only individuals we're doing the adjuvant therapy for are individuals with uh, palpable, uh, percutaneously uh, uh, proven lymph node disease. Uh, so uh, all of them get a dissection. None of them are, uh, we have not gotten to the point where we consider doing a central lymph node biopsy like in breast uh, to try to uh, not do the dissection. So all of those individuals currently get a full dissection. There is a concept of an index lymph node biopsy, kind of like in, in breast where the marker of fiducial is placed. Uh, and we are considering uh, going down that road of doing like in breast where just removing that index lymph node and then making the decision on the fatinectomy based upon that. Uh, there, there are some studies from Europe that have suggested that might be a benefit, but there are really small studies, like 20 patients or so, so it hasn't been adopted in private time yet. Yes. Thank you. I have questions related to melanoma. Uh, five years ago, I had a Chinese individual who was a mid 40s hematologist uh, with uh, his wife, and he had a nodule in the lobe thyroid. It turned out to be a neurodegenerative thyroid. Mm -hmm. What a title was. Three years ago, in the last three years, I've had three individuals, all Caucasian, some livers, in their 60s and over, who have come in with what I thought was. Dermatofibromas of the upper extremity. Resectative, cytopathology, all three have come back as Merkel. Now, the first two were neuroendocrine, instead of Nagineum, of the University of Washington. The last one was two months ago. They came back as Merkel, but it was squamous cell demon. I said that to Dr. Gao at the Dean Hospital. Now, 
Merkel, my little research is something like this has been there, I just wasn't aware of it. But three in three years, then that population, and now the uh, change from neuroendocrine to squamous cell, a little confounded by that. Yeah, Tom, is this appropriate or is it common? If not, we'll talk about yeah, no, I, I'm not familiar with the change from Merkel cell to squamous cell, that, that kind of distinction. But Merkel cell is certainly uh, a uh, malignancy that's dramatically increasing in uh, uh, incidence in the United States. Uh, we're not quite sure why, uh, and, and nor do we have the ideal treatments. There's a trial right now on uh, using adjuvant therapy after wide open excision and some of biopsy, which is the standard treatment right now. Uh, so we may be adding immunotherapy after the, I think it's SMART trial, it's an ART trial that's uh, evaluating that right now. So there may be some addition, uh, additional treatment. But the one th additional thing I would say about Merkel cell is unlike melanoma staging, which is melanoma staging for early stage melanomas is pretty much nothing. I do a chest x-ray, but most people don't do anything towards it. It's recommended by NCCN. For uh, Merkel cell, even if it's really small, uh, the recommendation from NCCN, though not super strong, is to, is to do a PET scan. Uh, so I would consider doing a uh, pretty robust complex staging just to make sure there is a distance sites. Uh, I would say this is a thank you for the presentation. I'm now ready to, to take the outside on the stability very good for both of you. Um, my question is with regards to the growing risk from Kevin and on the living and post growing risk from the and the kind of management of these treatments. So can you comment on the most up to date management of if you have a positive superficial lesion on the draw Yeah, so the, the, the question uh, is, uh, do you do a superficial only dissection or superficial and deep uh, dissection for, uh, so I, I, th that has evolved so much. I, you know, when I was training, uh, the thought was, if you had a positive sample of node, uh, then if it's microscopic disease only, you do a superficial groin dissection only. If it's palpable disease, you do a superficial and deep. I think most individuals are doing just a superficial alone if imaging doesn't show uh, disease in the iliac and obturator basin. I have to admit that in my own practice, I always do superficial deep. And the reason for that is that all of the morbidity of that surgery is from the superficial dissection, which is wound infection, dehiscence, um, you know, those complications, pain, are all from the superficial dissection. And if I'm already there, I had too many times where eventually there was deep disease that developed. So I kind of almost quasi prophylactically do the deep as well, because it doesn't increase the morbidity or risk. But that's not a word Well, thank you for uh, your film.